Senator Humphreys. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, the uh, uh, Australian Parliament um, has this week uh, taken a bold and decisive step, an historic step, uh, quite unprecedented uh, at this level of uh, Australian government, although it should be said not unprecedented at another uh, level of Australian government. Uh, this week uh, we have uh, engineered, I believe, a measure of resolution to an issue which has troubled and divided us as Australians for more than 10 years. We've used the authority, the gravitas of Parliament, as a tool to achieve an important public policy objective, not through uh, the enactment of legislation, but through the symbolism of a solemn and bipartisan uh, resolution to end a decisive, uh, rather a divisive chapter in the history of our relations with Indigenous Australia. I'm very, very proud to uh, be here today to participate in this process and proud that, uh, albeit belatedly, my party, the Liberal Party, has joined and endorsed this endeavour. I'm proud because this step is significant, significant far beyond the walls of this and the other chamber. Very often the things we do here reach the consciousness of uh, Australians generally as a dull and distant impression, if they indeed reach them at all. The things we have done today uh, here in this place uh, will undoubtedly be felt by huge numbers of Australians uh, in the most immediate and direct way. This week we've said sorry for the actions over several decades uh, of churches, institutions, police officers, court officials, doctors, individuals and by implication governments in participating in the involuntary removal of children from their families on the basis of their race. However well-meaning those actions, they led to enormous grief and heartache. Those actions did great damage to the confidence and self-esteem of those children, damage which resonates today, decades after the practice of forced removal has ended. It has been pointed out that many removals of Indigenous children were undertaken for the best of motives, and that, objectively speaking, the material, educational and health outcomes of those so separated were improved by virtue of their removal to other circumstances. In the physical sense, this will often have been true. Not always, of course, but often it will have been true. But that observation overlooks a very important consequence of forced removal. I had the privilege of participating in the Forgotten Australians inquiry, the, the sand inquiry into children in institutional care, one of uh, what Senator Murray refers to as the trifecta of reports on child welfare. That particular inquiry, the third in the series, reported in August 2004 and gave uh, those involved um, an insight into how damaging, uh, or how damaging uh, children has a ripple effect felt throughout society, creating very often damaged and dysfunctional adults. While we took evidence uh, from hundreds of people in that inquiry who had been separated from their families, often has to be said very dysfunctional families, I tried to identify that element of their separation which was most distressing, most harmful to their development as balanced human beings. And surprisingly, the answer was not uh, mistreatment or abuse at the hands of the institutions or foster families to which they were consigned, although of course many people gave evidence of mistreatment in those circumstances. But the fact of separation from people that these children believed loved them and wanted them and missed them. The separation from family where the children were old enough to remember their families was the single most corrosive factor undermining that child's sense of well-being, which no amount of care and material comfort could offset. If that was true of the general population of separated children, it was at least as true 
uh, of separated Indigenous children. Clearly, for so many children, that knowledge of their real family, kept from them by a cruel authority, was a constant gnawing pain, a rot to the soul which would leave a deep, indelible mark on every child, no matter how decent their treatment in their later homes. I was recently reading a collection of short stories told by Indigenous people about their experience of growing up apart from their families in homes and institutions where they were made to feel that their Aboriginality was a cause for humiliation and shame. Some of these stories pulsed with anger. Others were overlaid with a great sadness, a sense of loss. One particular story caught my eye because while the author spoke bluntly about the damage done to him and his family by their forced separation, he also spoke positively about the need to look forward towards a better future. He wrote, the past cannot be changed, but some of the wounds can be healed. I can think of no better way to express uh, what we all fear he feel here today and what we as a community are aiming to achieve through this apology. The decades since the releasing of the Bringing Them Home report has shown that wounds this deep cannot heal on their own. The previous federal government worked to improve the lot of Indigenous Australians in a range of practical ways, particularly through major funding and support for health, education and social welfare programs. But of course there was something missing in that approach. By not apologising for past wrongs, uh, we have been unable to draw a line between then and now, between what was done in the past and what we plan to do in the future. And so it has been, in some ways, hard for our community, black and white, to heal. Uh, for me, this uh, motion uh, today is about drawing that line. It says to the children of the Cootamundra Girls' Home, St Mary's Hostel, Retta Dixon House, the Parramatta Girls' Home, the Kinchella Boys' Home, Bedford Park, and dozens of other homes and missions that we regret the way they were treated, we acknowledge it to have been wrong, and we intend to ensure that it does not happen again to future generations. In doing so, we face up to an unpalatable truth about Australia's history. The nature of this truth has been much disputed. Exactly how many children were taken, for how long uh, and where to is sometimes <coughs> ambiguous, certainly not becoming any clearer as time goes on. Some people say that because of this uncertainty, we, should be issuing, we shouldn't be issuing an, an apology today. To be perfectly frank, that's just a cop-out. We know without doubt that some people in some past times experienced pain, suffering and loss of identity as a result of the policies and actions of successive Australian governments, and for that we should rightly be sorry. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, um, it is important for us to use today to be positive about the future and to acknowledge that despite the pain and disadvantage and dispossession which uh, these policies um, engendered, that many people, uh, both uh, through their own endeavours and, I hope, as a result of today's actions, will be able to move forward in a positive way and offset, at least partly, uh, the nature of the experience that they have suffered. Uh, one such uh, person uh, who appears to have had some level of resolution uh, is a man called John Williams Mosley. Um, a, a, a man taken from the Palm Valley area of the Northern Territory when he was eight months old, uh, separated from his mother at that very tender age. And some years later, he was able to meet his mother in these circumstances, and I wish to uh, quote from that. I spoke to my mother for the first time when I was 27 years old. The time was 11.37 p.m. on Friday, the 15th of September, 1978. I had just arrived at Tennant Creek from Sydney, where I'd lived and worked for the previous 27 years. Um, uh, he, saw, he describes how he, uh, he came to a house in Tennant Creek. My eyes followed the path in front of me to where I saw the silhouette of a woman standing in the half-light of the open door. Her hands were clasped together in front of her body, and she stood perfectly still. Even in the darkness, I could see tears rolling down her chubby cheeks. She held out her arms to embrace me, and I walked into them. We held each other for the longest time. I was home. Uh, I hope that by today's actions we help more uh, dispossessed, 
separated uh, people in this country to come home. And that would be the earnest hope, I'm sure, of everybody in this place today. Senator Bishop. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President, for the opportunity to make a contribution to this debate concerning the national apology to the stolen generation. This has indeed been a remarkable and lively topic of discussion for many, many years, more than we all care to remember. And it is appropriate, it is entirely proper, that there is now resolution of this most horrific of issues. It's time to move forward. The symbolism that this resolution represents is very, very important, as many people in a range of forums have repeatedly suggested. But more important now is that outcomes come and which are critical to a permanent resolution deriving from the harm that has occurred to so many Australians over the last 40 or 50 or more so years. Mr Acting Deputy President, some more than 20 years ago I attended uh, some conferences in New York City and attended upon some senior officials of the Retail and Wholesale Department Store Employees Union in that city. It in those days had some 250 or 300,000 members, a significant union, on the east coast of the United States. And I met for some time with a senior representative of that union in New York City. He was a man of uh, African-American extraction. And after we, we exchanged the customary pleasantries and had our discussion on the business at hand on a range of then topical issues, somehow or other the conversation shifted to issues germane to the treatment of Indigenous people in Australia in the 70s and 80s. And the dis discussion meandered on for some time. This man was in his 50s. Uh, and had been a veteran of the civil rights movement and battles in the United States in the 50s and 60s before he went on to another part of the uh, liberal movement in the United States. And at the end of the discussion, he looked at me with the most steely blue eyes and said, I meet a lot of Australians. A lot of Australians come and meet with me. And the common factor that you all bring to the discussions is the way you treat Aboriginal people in your own country. He said, I don't know why you all raise this issue with me, but you do so, and we have the discussions. And you must be the 20th or 30th person over the years who has raised these sorts of issues in my country, the United States. And he said to me at the end, young man, and I was very young in those days, he said, young man, I tire of these conversations with you from the other end of the world. Why don't you just go home and fix those problems? Because the fact that you've raised them here suggests to me that you are responsible and you need to attend to those problems in your own home. I've always remembered that conversation, and as I was thinking of the comments I should make today, it reminded me of those. In addition to those comments, I bring two other perspectives to this debate. Firstly, again, many, many years ago, I had exposure to hundreds of files in Perth held by the government relating to uh, in the old, what was then the old Department of Aboriginal Affairs or the Department of Native Welfare, and those files went right back to the 1920s and 1930s. And they'd been assiduously maintained in a warehouse back in 1982 or 83 that was located in West Perth. And I had exposure to those files uh, for many, many weeks on end doing some work. And in those files, properly maintained in detail, were hundreds and hundreds of letters written from the 1920s through into the 1960s 
from mothers and fathers of children who had gone missing or who had been removed or had been stolen, stolen imploring the bureaucrats in, the in whatever the department was called to give them advice as to why their child was taken, where the child was now, what the name of the child was, what had happened to the child. And there's hundreds and hundreds of these letters, mostly written in a beautiful script uh, um, and pouring out the emotions of these parents who had lost their children over some 40 or 50 or 60 years, the most heartfelt correspondence. And indeed, there was other correspondence from, from policemen and priests and pastors and local chambers of commerce and business people writing on behalf of other Indigenous people who presumably were illiterate but asking uh, for details as to where their children might be, how they might be located. And on each file there was a simple comment, government policy, advice, sender, we don't have to respond, we don't have any advice. And I remember as a 20 or 25 year old being exposed to those letters and thinking how horrible it must have been. The second perspective I bring is something that's occurred in more recent years where I have had exposure to a lot of uh, uh, basically, I suppose, uh, younger uh, children, not Aboriginal children, white children, who have been uh, through the court system in Perth. Um, and they come from what by any description would be called uh, dysfunctional families, whether their mother or father uh, is the subject of alcohol abuse, physical abuse, drug addiction, unemployment, a whole range of issues. And often the courts have to make a decision that the child or young boy or girl is to be removed from their parents and put into some form of foster home or welfare or institution. And my observation is, almost without exception, no matter how bad the child's upbringing might be, how dysfunctional the parent or parents might be, how manip manipulative or dishonest or engaging in, in grossly improper practices or engaging in, uh, in uh, acts of abuse, either of a physical or mental nature, against those young boys and girls from the age of about five or six when they be develop the ability to reason and to the age of 13 or 14 when they develop the sense of right and wrong, almost without exception those young boys and girls resist to the end being removed from their mother or father. No matter how bad their home might be, how often they're not fed, washed, sent to school, provided with love or affection, no matter how bad it is, it is they do not wish to be removed from their mother or father. So in that context, it still goes on, and it must have been absolutely horrific for those thousands and thousands of young Indigenous people uh, and their parents to be separated forcibly. In that context, a number of people have made the observation today that past actions shouldn't be judged by contemporary standards. A very, very interesting comment, because to me it seems to confuse absolute concepts of right and wrong and a relativist approach to issues. Always and without exception, it is wrong to steal, to engage in murder, to engage in rape, to engage in theft and like offences. It doesn't matter whether it was in the days of Hammurabi giving down the laws to the Assyrians or Solon's Athens. Always and without exception those offences are wrong and there is no justification for doing them or engaging in them. They might be lawful acts and they might be carried out pursuant to decisions of government policy, but they are always and without exception wrong. Um, and it is entirely proper to judge those absolute acts by today's standards because they were absolutely wrong then and they are absolutely wrong now. So, Mr. Recting, 
Deputy President. Uh, these, these, this, this debate now moves to practicalities and resolving the absolute poverty, the absolute Order. The Honourable Senator's time has expired. Senator Bernardi. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. In rising to take note of this motion, I would like to open my contribution by stating that I do not personally feel any sense of guilt for what has happened during Australia's brief history. I should also state that I am a very strong supporter of the very limited role that I believe government should occupy. I support an increasing self-reliance for all Australians and a reduced role of government in their lives. And today is a stark reminder that government intervention, no matter how well intentioned, may not actually benefit the people, but indeed it can in fact do the opposite. And that is not to say that governments haven't had a positive impact on the lives of Indigenous Australians. The Howard government stood firm in the face of great adversity to achieve practical outcomes for Indigenous people. We tried to break the cycle of poverty, of hopelessness and of dysfunction that afflicted many Aboriginal communities. And we did it by drawing a line between what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. We drew a line between what is right and what is wrong. We ceased to accept excuses and we tried to move forward. I realise now that what we didn't do was embrace the symbolism that is represented by an apology to the Aboriginal people for transgressions of previous government policies. But I do not believe that the uh, previous government, nor indeed any previous government, should stand condemned for this. There is no doubt in my mind that past practices in relation to the treatment of Indigenous Australians have caused significant distress to a number of people within that community. I am in no doubt that some children were unjustly taken from their families. But equally, I have no doubt that many of the so-called stolen generation were saved what would have been an all too brief uh, life of neglect and, in some instances, abuse. And let me be very clear that abuse, especially of children, can never and should never be defendable. I know that physical and sexual abuse of separated children took place in many areas of our community, and most alarmingly, it took place in the very areas in which, they, in which were designed to be sanctuaries. It was wrong, and it continues to be wrong. But unfortunately today, much of that abuse is now taking place within Aboriginal communities. And this is the substance of my contribution today. We need to stop the errors of the past from being a reason not to confront the vile acts of today. For my entire life, I've observed any number of excuses for dysfunction amongst some areas of Indigenous Australia. When I was 14, I was set upon by a gang of Aboriginal youths for daring to be on their land, as they put it, which happened to be Glenelg Beach in South Australia. Their violence went unpunished because, as I was told by a policeman, nothing would happen to them because they were Aboriginal. As a publican, I remember rescuing an Aboriginal woman from a savage attack on the street by her husband. And after providing her sanctuary within my premises, a group of elders then came to visit me and told me that unless I told her to leave my premises, they would, and I quote, destroy my hotel. For too long, this type of behaviour has gone unchallenged. For too long, excuses have been made that have established Indigenous issues in the minds of many Australians as simply too hard to deal with. And that is why I think today is very important. As I said, I feel no personal remorse or sorrow. In fact, I'm quite optimistic about the future because I feel that today is a day that our nation can move on together. And while saying sorry is a symbolic gesture, because, and it is a symbolic gesture because surely none of us can truly believe that tomorrow we'll see an end to the alcoholism, the violence, the child rape, the incest, the abuse that takes place in so many, in too many Aboriginal communities today. But tomorrow can see an end to the excuses for this type of abhorrent behaviour, because today is the first step in achieving reconciliation. But it is only the first step because reconciliation requires not just an act of self-mortification or sorrow. Reconciliation also requires forgiveness. And that is now the challenge confronting Indigenous Australia. They need to ditch the industry that has sprung up preventing the real cha changes, the policy areas that can have a significant impact 
on Indigenous communities from taking effect. They need to reject the inevitable overtures from the no win, no fee, ambulance chasing lawyers that will pop up as soon as tomorrow, I would guess, in pursuing billions of dollars in compensation. To do anything else would demonstrate that this call for sorry is more about compensation rather than reconciliation. And I sincerely hope that this is not the case. Senator Weber. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise uh, with a great deal of pride to associate myself with this resolution, because it's resolutions like this that I think really do uh, are, really are examples of what this parliament can do well. It does actually remind people that we are the national parliament, and it's only the national parliament that can take a proper stance on these issues. It's just a pity it's taken us so long to get there. When I was uh, thinking about the remarks I would like to make today, I was drawn to some, to some comments that uh, my good friend and former Premier of Western Australia, Dr Jeff Gallup, made when, when he was discussing a similar motion that went through the uh, Western Australian State Parliament in 1997. He commenced his remarks by telling the story of a person that he called Paul. He said he mentioned that Paul was not the real name of the person he was talking about, and I was drawn to that story that he spoke about because Paul was separated from his mother in 1964 when, she, when he was a baby. That is some one year before I was born. So these issues are very relevant to people of my generation. This isn't uh, necessarily an issue just to do with our um, more distant past. People are still living with this pain today. Dr Gallup went on to talk about Paul's separation from his mother. He said it was all done with the stroke of a pen and without his mother's knowledge, and that her subsequent efforts to find her son were treated with contempt by the department. Paul spent his, year, his growing up years in, in an appalling series of replacement homes. Um, there were breakdowns, cold institutions and cruel foster homes. When he was formally discharged from wardship at the age of 18 in 1982, he was given his file, which contained some 368 pages of old letters, photographs and birthday cards. The last page of his file stated that he was a very intelligent, likeable boy who had made remarkable progress given the unfortunate treatment of his mother by the department during his childhood. Paul said, his said that tears flowed when he read those words. They were tears from a mixture of relief at knowing, finally knowing about his past, of guilt and of anger about what had been done to him and his mother. I think it's important that we talk about stories like Paul's. As Prime Minister Rudd has said, the challenge for those of us who are not Indigenous Australians is to ask one very simple question. What if that was me? What if I was Paul? How would I feel? And that is, it should be the test of how we feel about passing motions like today. Political parties of all persuasions, particularly the, ma particularly the major political parties in Australian politics, uh, rightly acknowledge families as the cornerstone of our society. We, wait, we make much of our laws and policies that are intended to strengthen and help families and keep them together. It's often an issue that we debate in this place. But the rights of those families, the right of the family, have to be applied to all Australian families. And for far too long, until more recent times and until motions like today are passed, for far too long, Aboriginal families were torn apart by the very authorities that should have been there to protect them. And they were torn apart for no other reason than for the colour of people's skins. Those of us in this place, because uh, here we represent different interests in different states and in the other place, of course, different geographic locations, we know with, uh, with that role the importance that, I that identity places to people. 
We know how important it is to learn of our identity and the identity of our community, to learn of our historical connections and our relationships through history. That's what we do if we are truly human. The fundamental right people have to establish their identity, however, was taken away through an active policy throughout the states and territories and the Commonwealth of Australia for our Indigenous people. That policy was based upon the premise that Aboriginality had no role to play in the Australian community. By passing this motion today, we now have the opportunity <coughs> to tell our Indigenous Australians that they are part of our society, they are part of our history, and that they are part of our community, and that we apologise to them for the efforts made by earlier governments to attempt to deny them that very basic right. So let us, as a parliament, come together. Let us offer dignity to Indigenous Australians about their own history and its, and its effect on our national history, our shared national history, by acknowledging the past forcible removal of Indigenous children and offering our deepest apologies for what happened in the past. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to make some brief remarks uh, in uh, this very, very important parliamentary discussion, and I'm pleased to have the honour, as I regard it, of participating in this uh, parliamentary resolution of apology. I do think it is an occasion of great significance for our parliament, for Indigenous Australians, for our nation, and for our nation's future. Since my first speech in 1997, which I'll avoid the self-indulgence of actually quoting, I have supported an apology to Indigenous Australians of the stolen generations. It was not necessarily a popular claim to make in 1997 from my side of the chamber. I think today's resolution, though, is a very important step in the history of reconciliation in this country. And to those men and women who have campaigned long and hard for this apology and in other aspects of reconciliation, I truly hope that you are able to take a great deal from this day and from this parliamentary resolution. I've heard other speakers uh, today in this chamber and elsewhere talk <coughs> about their experience of living in Indigenous communities, and I can't lay claim to that experience. However, I have found in the last uh, 10 or so years that one of the great privileges of this role in the Senate has been an opportunity to have learned much more about Indigenous Australia and Australians than I had known before I came here. For that, I thank some of my colleagues who, uh, who were in, part, in part formed uh, the instruction team uh, along the way based on their own enthusiasm and own interest, and perhaps ironically, I thank the Senate committee process. The committee processes of the Senate, uh, I think, are sometimes regarded as a practice of the darker arts, but in this case, it is indeed a, great valuable, a greatly valuable experience and has afforded me a chance across the nation, in the Northern Territory, in Queensland, in Western Australia, in New South Wales, in Victoria, here in Canberra, to meet with a range of leading Indigenous Australians and many members of the community to discuss a very broad list of issues over time, from the issue we discuss here today, the stolen generations, the subject of this motion, to the detention of juvenile offenders, to reconciliation more broadly and, in fact, more recently, to the question of stolen wages. With my colleagues, I have heard many personal stories and testimonials in these discussions, sometimes highly emotional and highly disturbing, sometimes so coldly factual that they were even more devastating in their effect about some of the personal and family experiences of these, our fellow Australians. And through that process of, uh, of listening, overwhelmingly listening, I have been persuaded that the symbolism of this apology is indeed very important 
and it, that it does have the capacity to make a real difference to our capacity to move forward in relations between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. I've been interested listening to some of the discussions about the value of symbols. It seems to me that as members and senators in this place, we work in an environment laden with symbolism and in 2008 still redolent with tradition. I think it's actually very difficult for us to judge for others, culturally and personally, what is a validly important symbol. But I do hope that this symbolic step of apology does have the desired outcome for members of the stolen generation and their families and is a step forward on the path to reconciliation in Australia. In saying that, Mr Acting Deputy President, it is emphatically not a rejection of the importance of what has become known as practical reconciliation. Without the basic advantages of life that the overwhelming majority of Australians take for granted in terms of health and life expectancy and education and living circumstances, and so the list goes on, Without those, there is no capacity to move forward, and I absolutely acknowledge that and want that to be a very important part of my remarks this afternoon. But the link between symbolic and practical reconciliation that I hope this apology establishes and confirms is one which I further hope enables us as a nation to, uh, to move so much further forward. I particularly in the last 10 years want to acknowledge and congratulate the women of Indigenous Australia that I've had the most extraordinary honour and pleasure of meeting. In so many cases, it has been their leadership in their communities, in their families, in the face of unknowable adversity for women in the situation that I, the previous speaker and many others in this place enjoy. It has been their leadership that has enabled governments to actually pick up the steps of pra practical reconciliation and move, though, move towards implementation uh, in that regard. Mr Acting Deputy President, I quite honestly can't imagine the pain of being separated from one's living family. I have enough trouble dealing on a daily basis with the loss of both my parents relatively early in adulthood, but I do know that my family grounds me, that my family helps me know where I actually belong. In his remarks in the members' hall today, I heard a person for whom I have an enormous amount of respect, Tom Kalmer, the Social Justice Commissioner of the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission, talk about the importance of belonging in the context of this apology and in the context of the experiences of his own family. It's not rocket science to understand that if you're dislocated, if you're separated from your family, that it's hard to know where you belong. And that doesn't just go for Indigenous Australians, of course, but today is about the impact of these actions, of these policies on Indigenous Australians over decades in this country. When I finally saw the resolution moved uh, by the government yesterday afternoon, after waiting, I thought quite patiently, not something I'm known for, I was struck particularly by the last, I think they are the last five clauses of the resolution, which refer so importantly to the future. A future where the parliament is able to resolve that these injustices must never be repeated. Where we are able to harness the determination of all Australians that hopefully today will reinforce to close the gaps that I spoke about before, life expectancy, education and economy. A future where we do look at new solutions to enduring problems where, as the resolution says, old approaches have failed and without an acknowledgement of that it is impossible to move forward. A future that is based on mutual respect, mutual resolve and mutual responsibility. And one in the last clause which says where all Australians, whatever their origins, are truly equal partners, with equal opportunities and with an equal stake in shaping the next chapter in the history of this great country. They are, Mr Acting Deputy President, very powerful words 
and ones to which I am very proud to commit myself absolutely. I think the parliamentary resolution is one which provides for this nation in so many ways an opportunity to advance on the path of reconciliation and something which uh, I am proud to see uh, we can all participate in here today. Senator Forshaw. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to um, support uh, the resolution of this Senate and the extension of the apology on behalf of the parliament to the members of the stolen generation and their families, and indeed to all of the Aboriginal and uh, Torres Strait Islander Indigenous people of this country. Uh, it is often said that um, words have no real meaning without actions, that uh, words can never hurt, or that uh, you know, that old uh, saying that uh, sticks and stones will break your bones but won't, words will never hurt me. Well, it's not true, Mr Acting Deputy President. Words are powerful. Words can hurt, but words can heal. And today, what we are doing is through this apology, these remarkable words, we are endeavouring to help to heal. To say that we apologise for the wrongs of the past. And indeed, we apologise for the mistreatment, the neglect that still continues today. And that is why it is so important for the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people, for the Indigenous people of this great nation. They have known all along how important the apology would be to them. They know that it doesn't uh, uh, necessarily right all the wrongs, but they know how deeply important it is that we extend this apology. And we, the non-Indigenous people of this country, have come finally to understand the power of the words that an apology would have. That it would mark a turning point in the history of this nation when we finally, in a public way, at the level of the parliament of this nation, extended this apology. I have listened to the speech of the Prime Minister and heard the speech of the Leader of the uh, Government in the Senate today and listened to other speeches and there's not really much I can add to what has been said because it has been said and rather than try and, um, as it were, you know, be eloquent about it in my own terms, I, I simply adopt and endorse the words of the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Government in the Senate and of the other leaders and representatives of this parliament that they have put. I can't do it any better. And um, I think really, in some respects, whilst today it is important to reflect upon the what was in the Bringing Them Home report. Um, it is also, I think, important to, to recognise that, that an apology often can be simple and more powerful. So, saying you're sorry um, should say it all, and I hope it does. I listened to uh, and I, I read the report a couple of years ago and I've listened to the recounting of the stories of those stolen generations and like all senators and members, you know, you, you feel um, 
um, uh, you know, the, and understand, try to understand the, the terrible circumstances in which many of those people um, uh, had to, uh, to grow up, torn from their families and their loved ones. Mr Acting Deputy President, um, where I come from in the Sutherland Shire, um, it of course is often characterised as the birthplace of the Australian nation. When Captain Cook landed at what is now Kurnell um, on the April the 29th, 1770. And for many years that date was commemorated and celebrated as the date of the birthplace of the Australian nation. Each year a ceremony would be held at Kurnell on the shores of Botany Bay. But some years ago we realised, the Sutherland Shire Council and others realised that that was not appropriate. That rather we had to recognise on that same day that it was also the day when the dispossession, if you like, of the lands of the Indigenous people commenced to occur in this country. And so what happened was the day the commemoration was changed from one which not just only celebrated and commemorated Cook's great voyage of discovery and landing in Australia at Botany Bay, but also that this was a meeting of two cultures that this was a symbolic day for the Aboriginal people. And now each year on the 29th of April, that ceremony celebrates both Cook's Landing but also recognises the incredible impact that that uh, event ultimately led to in terms of the Indigenous people of this country. And each year, Indigenous people representatives of the community of that area um, participate in that ceremony in a way in which we saw the uh, ceremony yesterday with the welcome to country here in Parliament House. And so it is now celebrated as and commemorated as not as either a, an achievement or as a dispossession, which it was, depending upon which way you look at it, from which perspective of either white Australia or Indigenous people, but rather as a meeting of two cultures and an opportunity to go forward and endeavour to ensure that Indigenous people of this country, uh, their culture is protected and enriched. Yesterday I attended the ecumenical service um, at St Christopher's here in Manuka prior for the opening of Parliament and I was impressed by the sermon of um, Bishop, uh, Archbishop Coleridge, where there was reference made to, I think, the fact that uh, Pope John Paul VI expressed sorrow for the treatment that the Catholic Church had over centuries extended or, or um, meted out to people of the Jewish faith. And I raise that because at the heart of Christianity, of course, is the concept of expressing sorrow. And I think it's in that context that we should, certainly those of us who follow the Christian faith, should, uh, should also consider this event. It's not about whether or not you know, we personally were responsible for the misdeeds and the treatment and the massacres and the dispossession that occurred in the past. Now, that may certainly be a historical fact that we personally are not responsible. But that, that is not the point. The point is that you know, if we believe in righting the wrongs of the past, it is appropriate for us to express our sorrow and apology for those deeds that were done in the past. And when I hear speakers refer to what has happened with the Northern Territory intervention as a result of the Little Children Are Sacred report. I ask myself, why is it 
that some of us can recognise that that mistreatment needs to be dealt with now, but somehow we should, not, we should ignore or not recognise the importance of all of the mistreatment that went before it. And indeed, much of what is happening today within those Aboriginal communities that we are endeavouring to fix through that intervention is a result of that legacy. I sincerely apologise to the stolen generations. Thank you, Senator Forshaw. Senator Adams. Thank you, Mr. Senator Acting. Adams. Sorry? Senator Adams. Yes. So, so who are you calling? Senator, Senator Adams. Adams. Oh, right. I thought you were looking at me, aren't you? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Um, I was confused too, seeing your eyes. I enjoyed it. Uh, Good, senior. right. <laughs> uh, thank you. I rise this evening to speak to the national apology, which was moved on behalf of the Australian Parliament earlier today. I will be honest and say it is hard to apologise for a series of wrongs carried out under various acts of Parliament many years ago. The people who carried out these wrongs obviously thought that they were doing the best for Indigenous children at that time. But as we learn more about the problems which occurred then, we are all horrified that something like this could happen in our country. But I also concur with my colleagues who have spoken earlier today that this apology is the first step forward into the future. As we have heard this morning, this future is to be based on mutual respect, mutual resolve and mutual responsibility. And I must say at this stage that I was very disappointed as a senator that we were not invited to go into the other place to um, actually hear the words of the apology because I felt looking around the chamber here, uh, we were all alone. Um, we couldn't actually hear the Prime Minister deliver that apology. So um, I don't know the reason, but I do think at nine o'clock our house did not um, commence until 9.30 that perhaps we should have been perhaps invited there, but that's in hindsight. So I've um, certainly read what was said. And um, I would like to say at this stage that developments in Australia's states and territories uh, towards an apology certainly um, happened after the bringing, the home, bringing Them Home report was tabled. And to date, all state and territory parliaments have passed motions expressing regret for past actions with respect to Aboriginal families, and most of the motions include an explicit apology for the forced separation of children. New South Wales did this on the 18th of June in 1997. South Australia on the 28th of May 1997, Queensland the 3rd of June 1997, Western Australia on the 27th and 28th of May 1997, the Australian Capital Territory the 17th of June 1997, Victoria the 17th of September 1997, and Tasmania the 13th of August 1997. And I just would like, being a, a senator from Western Australia, I would just like to read the uh, Western Australian contribution on the 27th of May 1997, which was ta uh, tabled as Aborigines and Family Separation. Mr Court, the Premier, it is appropriate that this House show respect for Aboriginal families that have been forcibly separated as a consequence of government policy in the past by observing a period of silence, and members at that time stood for one minute silence. The next day, on the 28th of May 1997, Aborigines and family separation. Dr Gallup, Leader of the Opposition. I move that this House apologises to the Aboriginal people on behalf of all West Australians for the past policies under which Aboriginal children were removed from their families and expresses deep regret at the hurt and distress that this caused. Now, this was the start. And, um, as uh, we uh, have heard from many speakers, um, the Howard government also, um, in, uh, earlier on, um, passed 
a motion of respect for what had happened, but this was not an apology. Um, today has uh, certainly changed the lives, I hope, for those people that have felt that deep hurt. And um, as it was a unanimous decision from uh, both the government and the alternative government, I do hope that this is going to go some way to helping in the future. And there are ways that we can do this. Um, I'll perhaps just pause to say that, uh, unfortunately, in Western Australia, possibly um, Western Australians, whether they've had more contact with their um, Aboriginal counterparts or we've had a number of problems there, Headlines in the paper say WA voters reject this is in the West Australian WA voters reject Rudd's apology. And then we have um, from Jerry Warber, a member of the Stolen Generation, he's a 75-year-old who was brought up at um, Sister Kate's home, says an apology will not change the past. Sorry, just another word. That's headlines in the West Australian as well on the February the second. And uh, just to quote Mr Warber, saying sorry is only a matter of rhetoric because some people are demanding it and it opens the floodgates for compensation. And the compensation is something that worries me as well, but I will discuss that later. But uh, Mr Warber and uh, his, um, a number of other older Aboriginals who grew up at Sister Kate's have um, been working very, very hard. They are a family and they are trying to um, raise a million, a $9 million, um, which is close to fruition, which will enable two groups of former Sister Kate's children to build an aged care home and a healing centre on the site so they can spend their later years in the company of some of the only family many of them have known. And I think this is a great incentive, and I do hope that um, whether it be the uh, federal government and the state government, that that um, actually can be done, because uh, that's a positive, and I want to move to the future. The past has been well discussed um, today, and I think we have to go forward, and the way to go forward is something like this, showing that, right, we can do something to help these people who were a family, even though they were not related. That would be a wonderful gesture. So I do hope you know, Mr Warber, at 75, and his colleagues, and one of these was Sue Gordon, whom uh, we all know has been very, very involved with the um, federal government's task force as the chair and also in the um, Ab um, Aboriginal or Indigenous Council, which unfortunately has now been um, disbanded, and we're hoping that something will come up in that place. But for Western Australia, we have quite a long way to go, and I would like to um, advise the um, Senate of this. Um, unfortunately, crime has become uh, quite difficult in Western Australia, and, un and also, unfortunately, most of the people that um, have uh, been involved with this have been young Aboriginal children. And i am um, a little worried about how we get them on track, and also we had a very nasty incident in Geraldton about three weeks ago with um, a pastoralist playing beach cricket with his family, and um, unfortunately some Aboriginal youth decided to try and steal their um, uh, wine, and uh, he consequently was hit over the head with a baseball bat and died. Last uh, Thursday week, I attended a funeral in Perth of one of our past members of, um, or past member for Geraldton, uh, Mr. Bob Bloffwich, and there were about 800 people at that funeral, and I was just overwhelmed by people coming to me and saying, "Look, enough's enough. Don't you go and apologise on my behalf." So these are the sort of issues that we have in our state, and. The number of bag snatchers, elderly people um, being knocked over in the street and, and uh, really having problems. Um, Western Australia does have a lot to do, and also up in the um, Kimberley area, of course, with Halls Creek and um, uh, Fitzroy Crossing uh, and Balgo, all of these communities which I've visited, and with the petrol sniffing inquiry, probably one thing for me as a member of um, 
Community Affairs um, Committee. I've been able to travel to a lot of these places. I was a nurse, I was a midwife, I've worked in all of these areas delivering Aboriginal women, sitting with them through the labour and hearing stories about what we have been discussing in the last day. So it's just something I'd like to um, promote here. We have what we call the Australian Defence Force Parliamentary Program. And this year, within the choices that my fellow um, members of parliament have, is um, an opportunity to spend a week with the North Force um, members and to travel around through these communities. So I would suggest that this might be a way as, that we can all learn how we can go forward. This is, of course, part of the um, Northern Territory intervention plan, but that's an opportunity that we can do, and I think that it'd be great to see a number of us um, take that up. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Adams. Um, now can I call Senator Boyce? Thank you, Mr. Senator, Senator, Sen Senator Boyce. Um, thank, thank you, Mr. Acting President. And, and firstly, I must say, uh, having received uh, in my office only about four minutes ago a list that actually had my name on it, I'm rather surprised to be here at the moment and, and would have appreciated. Uh, a bit more notice, as obviously Senator Abetz would have, as to how this was going to uh, pan out. Oh, you've been on my list all morning, Senator. Would have been good if it was in the <laughs> office too, Mr <laughs> Acting President. Um, I certainly want to add my uh, voice to those who are saying sorry today as individuals and recognising that as state and federal governments we have much to be sorry for to the Indigenous peoples of Australia, not just to those who were forcibly removed as children from their families, but to everyone um, who has been affected adversely by uh, white settlement in Australia since 1788. There can be no disputing that that happened. But I have felt uneasy, I suppose, over the last few days, a sense that to not see everything that was being done as perfect and complete and covering every part of the issue was to be seen almost as curmudgeonly and mean-spirited, not to agree with the whole uh, process as it was and every little facet of that process. And I suppose for me the uh, article this morning in The Age by Mr Tony Wright uh, crystallised for me what I was finding wrong with this whole process. And it is that in many ways we aren't telling the full story. Much uh, was made yesterday, uh, yesterday at the Indigenous Welcome to Parliament, which was a fabulous initiative, I think, and in fact was recommended um, in a 2001 joint standing report chaired by former Liberal member of the House of Representatives, Gary Nairn. This was one of the recommendations that that committee made, that there should be an Indigenous welcome at the opening of every parliament. Um, coincidentally, this committee also recommended that the current Australian of the Year, whoever that might be, might speak at such an opening on behalf of the Australian people and that the opening of parliament be held in the Great Hall to enable more people to come along. I think these are both initiatives that we should consider in the future. But what much was made at the uh, ceremony yesterday of the treatment of Mr Jim Clements, um, also known as King Billy, a Wurundjeri man who uh, arrived after walking many miles uh, in a, a battered old suit and barefoot with his dogs. It was commented on that he was actually clear, told to clear off by the police. Mr Wright's article in The Age this morning points out that that wasn't the full story. In fact, when that happened, a good group of the crowd said, no, stand your ground, you stay here. One of the, uh, a member of the clergy, a prominent member of the clergy who was there at the, on the same occasion said, this man, Mr Clements, has more right to be here than any other of the rest of us. And people apparently threw coins um, at uh, King Billy. I presume that was in a gesture of, of charity at the time, which probably is cringeworthy now, but wasn't then. <coughs> and 
he ended up not only standing on the steps for the opening of the parliament in 1927, but he was amongst VIPs who met the Duke and Duchess of Kent the next day. That is the full story of the treatment of Mr Clements. And I think that we do ourselves a disservice if we are so keen to paint the black, the dark picture of treatment of people that we don't also see that there are good people and always have been good people who will fight and continue to fight for the rights of particularly Indigenous people whose situation is currently not a good one. In looking at this issue and preparing my thoughts on this issue, I went back to the motion of reconciliation that was passed by this parliament in August 1999, and I would like to quote it. It reads that this House reaffirms its wholehearted commitment to the cause of reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians as an important national priority for all Australians. Recognising the achievements of the Australian nation commits to work together to strengthen the bonds that unite us, to respect and appreciate our differences, and to build a fair and prosperous future in which we can all share. Reaffirms the central importance of practical measures leading to practical results that address the profound economic and social disadvantage which continues to be experienced by many Indigenous Australians. Recognises the importance of understanding the shared history of Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians and the need to acknowledge openly the wrongs and injustices of Australia's past. Acknowledges that the mistreatment of many Indigenous Australians over a significant period represents the most blemished chapter in our national history, expresses its sincere, deep and sincere regret that Indigenous Australians suffered injustices under the practices of past generations and for the hurt and trauma that many Indigenous people continue to feel as a consequence of those practices, and believes that we, having achieved so much as a nation, can now move forward together for the benefit of all Australians. As you may note, that apart from the word sorry, this motion covers every aspect of the motion that we have agreed to today. It covers current disadvantage. It fully acknowledges past wrongs and injustices, the hurt and the trauma that those injustices caused and still cause, and it highlights the need for practical and radical improvement of the way that we help Indigenous people in Australia. To me, that 1999 statement is part of telling the full story of our journey towards a true reconciliation and moving forward. I'd also like to mention um, there has been much made, I think, of, of people of Indigenous background and their involvement in this parliament. There have been far too few. But one that I would like to honour today is the late Senator Neville Bonner, a younger man who was the first, Lib first senator of uh, Aboriginal background to serve in this parliament and a Liberal senator, a man from my own state and a man who taught our party and our people a lot about how to go about assisting people of in an Indigenous background. Um, I'd also, I guess, like to talk about the fact that there has been an improvement, there has been change. If you look at figures from the uh, Medical Journal of Australia published last year, the life expectancy for Indigenous women has increased from 65 to 67.9 years in the past 10 years. Now, this is, this is nowhere good enough. Uh, you know, we must close the gap. But there has been change. There have been improvements. There are uh, actions and there are policies designed to put some practical background behind what we have done to date uh, in this area. And on that basis, I would like to definitely put my voice, add my voice to that view that, yes, we must say sorry, and yes, we must add a practical aspect to that by supporting the moves that are currently going on in the Northern Territory to assist people to come to the situation where they can go on themselves. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy. Thank you, Senator Boyce. Uh, Senator Hogg. Thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise briefly uh, today in this debate to, the, to support the motion uh, 
on of sorrow that has been passed in this chamber today. I feel that the motion itself is terribly important because the motion shows a solidarity with Indigenous people. And I use the word solidarity very, very carefully because it is something that people who have known uh, uh, a, a dispossession come to grips with when they know that those who have possessions, uh, they know that those people are as one with them. And I'm sure that that's the thrust of what is being put here in this chamber and has been put here and passed today, that we are at one feeling a solidarity with our Indigenous Australians who have been so bereft of uh, a, a real comfort over a long period of time because of many injustices that have been placed upon them. And there, therefore, I believe that this is an important step in the healing process of this nation. Of course, I support the comments of the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Government uh, in this uh, particular debate. But in particular, I wanted to refer to the, the words of the Prime Minister when he referred to the stolen generations were human beings, not an intellectual curiosity human beings deeply damaged by the decision of parliaments and governments. And that's something that has not been focused on in my view. We are dealing with humanity. We are dealing with human beings. No different from any of the rest of us. The major difference may well be the colour of the skin. The major difference may well be their opportunity. Their major difference may well be their life expectancy. The major difference may well be the hurt that they've suffered. But the reality is they are human beings and as such need to be seen, to be treated with the dignity that human beings deserve. I believe that it is a fundamental right of every individual human being, and no more or no less for our Indigenous Australians, that they have the right to that dignity as well, and that that right to that dignity is expressed through the solidarity of the uh, resolution that was passed in the other chamber and this chamber today. This dignity should prevail through the, st the stages, various stages of life. It's not something that is just uh, gained at birth, not something gained in youth, and not something gained simply at the end of life. It's some something that is a continuum through life. And of course, with much of the injustice that many of our Indigenous Australians have suffered, they have not had that opportunity to experience the dignity of life that they deserve. I'm not ex uh, seeking to expand on the, on the apology um, as a statement as such, because I believe it enunciates the heartfelt and strong sorrow that many of us have experienced in this country for a long time. I share that sorrow and I wholly endorse the apology as adopted by our parliament. And I see it, as others have said, as a positive way forward on reconciliation. To express one's sorrow is important indeed. But then the next step is having expressed one's sorrow, then you don't go back and repeat the errors of your ways. You don't sin anymore, as they say. And I think that that's the significance of the statement 
the significance of the process, that having, having recognised our own inadequacies, that we have said that we are sorry, it is a sorrow that comes from within the heart. Because if one doesn't have that, then the sorrow is shallow indeed. And I think the expressions that I have heard in this uh, debate on the issue in general shows that the sorrow is deep, is, is heartfelt, and that people genuinely don't want to see a repeat of what has happened previously. I believe that the solidarity shown by the Parliament of Australia and other parliaments before us in the States will give hope to our Indigenous Australians that there is a future and a bright future where their dignity will be respected, their dignity will grow, and it will grow because of the respect that we show to each other as human beings. I commend the recommendation of the Senate and I support it fully. Thank you, Senator Hull. Senator Kemp. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President. Uh, I rise to support the motion regarding an apology uh, to those Indigenous Australians who were forcibly removed uh, from their families and communities under the laws of past state and federal governments. The Leader of the Opposition, uh, Brendan Nelson, has uh, spoken eloquently uh, on this matter today uh, on behalf of uh, the Coalition. There has been, uh, as we all know, a long-standing debate on the appropriateness of one generation apologising for another. At least uh, as far as this parliament is concerned, this debate uh, is now over. Nevertheless, there will be a continuing debate in the community on the appropriateness uh, of what the parliament has done today. Just 11 years ago, in moving a motion of reconciliation, uh, John Howard said the treatment of Indigenous peoples was, and I quote, without any doubt the greatest blemish and stain on the Australian national story. This motion recognised the mistreatment of many Indigenous Australians over a significant period and expressed uh, deep and sincere regret that Indigenous Australians had suffered injustices under the practices of past generations and for the hurt and trauma that many Indigenous people continue to feel as a consequence of those practices. The, the parliament today has reinforced that statement, in a sense, with the use of the word sorry. This is, as I think most senators understand, a complex issue. And uh, as the Aboriginal leader Noel Pearson said in an extensive uh, article in the Australian newspaper yesterday, and let me quote his words, the truth is the removal of Aboriginal children and the breaking up of Aboriginal families is a history of complexity and great variety. People were stolen. People were rescued. People were brought in chains. People were brought by their parents. Mixed blood children were in danger from their tribal stepfathers, while others were loved and treated as their own. People were in danger from whites, and people were protected by whites. The motivations and actions of those whites involved in this history, governments and missions, range from cruel to caring, malign to loving, well-intentioned to evil. Some of the examples of the removal of Aboriginal children that have been stated before this parliament are simply horrific. They demonstrate that uh, bureaucracies, as well as having the potential for good, uh, also have the potential for great evil. It is appropriate to say sorry to people who have suffered so dreadfully from the actions uh, of governments and its officers. But it would be wrong, uh, also wrong, not to acknowledge that there were children who were rescued from dreadful circumstances. And there were white missionaries who had the, the interests of Indigenous people at heart. And Noel Pearson refers to a Bavarian missionary who, in his view, 
will always be a hero. An apology can have both positive and negative aspects. It will be interesting to see whether in the coming weeks and months the government, having taken this step, reverts to the failed policies of the past. Or, as so many speakers have indicated, uh, this will be a springboard uh, for moving on and ad addressing the real problems of Aboriginal disadvantage. Today's apology is a very specific apology relating to the harm caused by the removal of Aboriginal children from their families. It should uh, not and cannot obscure the fact that policies which have been uh, put into place by governments prior to the Northern Territory intervention have damaged Aboriginal people over the last 30 years and more. The lives of many thousands of Aboriginal people have been blighted by these failed policies. They are as worthy of an apology as the policy for which we are apologising today. The road to hell, as the old saying goes, is paved with good intentions. And there is no doubt that the Indigenous policy makers in the post-war period have, in my view, a lot to answer for. Like many parliamentarians, I have visited Indigenous communities in the Northern Territory, and one cannot uh, but be struck by the examples of overriding poverty and despair in some of these communities. Indeed, I believe it is a scandal that such circumstances could exist in Australia today. By every measure, life expectancy, child mortality, unemployment, literacy and violence, the policies of the last 30 years have failed. Indeed, some future parliament may well be apologising for our failure. The Northern Territory uh, Government's uh, Little uh, Children of Sacred report showed the shocking conditions in Indigenous communities in the Northern Territory. It summarised. A number of underlying causes are said to explain the present state of both town and remote communities. Excessive consumption of alcohol is variously described as the uh, result of poverty, unemployment, lack of education, boredom, and overcrowded and inadequate housing. The use of other drugs and petrol sniffing can be added to these. Uh, together, they lead to excessive violence. In the worst case scenario, it leads to sexual abuse of children. It is inexcusable that the Northern Territory government had allowed this situation to develop. And what are the policies which have led to this result? Just let me summarise uh, some of these policies unrestricted welfare, reverse apartheid through the permit system, absence of proper policing in many Indigenous communities, failure to control alcohol, uh, drugs and pornography, concealing of abuse by welfare agencies, almost complete neglect of needs in education, health and housing in remote communities. My brother, Dr David Kemp, by establishing national standards for numeracy and literacy, exposed, possibly for the first time, the shocking neglect of education for Indigenous children in remote communities in the Northern Territory and elsewhere. These policies, let us not forget, remained in place because of misguided symbolism and political correctness, and stayed in place until John Howard and Mal Brough had the courage to act to save the children. The Howard government, to its enormous credit, broke from the failed policies of the last 30 years when former Minister Mal Brough uh, announced uh, the Northern Territory National Emergency Response Bill. And Mr Brough said in his uh, second reading speech, when confronted with a failed society where basic standards of law and order and behaviour have broken down and where women and children are unsafe, how should we respond? Do we respond with more of what we have done in the past, or do we radically change direction with an intervention strategy matched to the magnitude of the problem? He went on, we are providing extra police. We will stem the flow of alcohol, drugs and pornography, assess the health situation of children, engage local people in improving living conditions and offer more employment opportunities and activities for young people. We aim to limit the amount of cash available for alcohol, drugs and gambling during the emergency period and make a strong link between welfare payments and school attendance. 
Now that an apology uh, has been said, it is time to approach again the pressing issues of the safety of children and the well-being of Aboriginal communities. A great deal of work remains to be done. Thank you, Senator Kemp. Senator McLucas. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I firstly would like to acknowledge the tra traditional owners on who co whose country we are meeting here today. And I'd also like to acknowledge all traditional owners and elders across our country. I want to thank Matilda House uh, for her welcome uh, yesterday, uh, Matilda House and her delegation, for their ge generosity of their welcome that we received yesterday. And in doing so, I want to congratulate all the people who were involved in that moving ceremony that we witnessed. As Senator Boyce has said, yes, this has been on the cards for a very long time, and it's wonderful that it has finally become a part uh, of uh, the ceremony of opening a parliament in this place. And I was particularly pleased to hear the Leader of the Opposition commit to, the, to uh, continuing with a welcome to country into the future. Uh, yesterday heralded a new dawn for relations between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and uh, non-Indigenous Australians uh, uh, yesterday. And that has been built on today. It is an understatement, in my view, to say that today is an historic day for all Australians. The celebration that this parliament has seen throughout today is something that will not be forgotten for a very long time. Uh, the laughter and the tears, the emotion, the people coming together, Indigenous Australians, non-Indigenous Australians, coming together to celebrate an important day in the history of our country. It gives me enormous pride and a sense of relief to today wholeheartedly support the motion that has been carried unanimously in the Senate and the House today. I commend the Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, and the Minister for Indigenous Affairs, Jenny Macklin, for all of their efforts to ensure that the words in this motion were consulted with indig Indigenous people and for planning such a wonderful day here in Canberra. I also agree that today's motion of apology is not about us as senators and members of parliament. It is a day for Indigenous people in particular, but a day for all Australians to come together to right past wrongs. The words of the motion are very important. I encourage all Australians to take the time to read them, to know what they mean and to know personally uh, of the intent behind them. The words are, are designed to, firstly, recognise the indisputable fact that past actions instigated and or sanctioned by parliaments and governments resulted in many, many thousands, we don't actually know the number, but many thousands of indigen Indigenous children being taken from their mothers and their families because of their race. And that's the key. That's the very significant difference that we need to remember in this debate today. It was because they were black that they were taken, and that is the sorrow that they live with. The words are designed to show that we, as non-Indigenous Australians, want to say that we are sorry for what occurred. As a mother, I cannot understand, I cannot imagine the abject loss the emptiness that mothers who had their children stolen endured, endured for the rest of their lives in many, many cases. I can't contemplate the fear that people lived it with, waiting for the welfare, hiding their children as we know they did. The words are drafted to show that we understand the toll that the practices of forced removal, of, uh, of fostering, so-called, of being placed into unpaid labour, of institutionalisation, have wrecked on Indigenous Australians. And the words are drafted to make it clear that we know that much has to be done to bridge the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. The tenor of the Prime Minister's speech and many others, including, I must say, the Leader of the Opposition, in this and the other place, have been sincere and heartfelt. Australians can take heart from the leadership that has been shown today, that we as a nation have
taken a very large step towards a reconciled Australia. In May 1997, I was fortunate to be in attendance at the National Reconciliation Convention. And at the end of that convention, very emotionally uh, up and down uh, meeting, uh, Pat Dod Dodson invited us uh, to walk with him on the road to reconciliation. What we have witnessed today restarts that proce process of reconciliation anew. I have talked about what the words in the motion say. I think it's also important to talk about what the words don't say. The words don't apportion blame. They don't encourage people to feel guilt. There is nowhere in those words that tries to point a finger at anyone, at any group or at any particular government action. There is no purpose in doing so. The words don't apportion blame, nor do they encourage guilt. The words do not seek to advance the value of symbolism above the real and obvious need for improved outcomes for, in terms of health, education and employment for Indigenous people. It is not one or the other. It is not symbolism or services and programs. It's both. Of course it's both. And that's how it should be. We need, as a nation, to lay down a marker to acknowledge the horrifying, the unthinkable truth of the stolen generation era and to sincerely apologise. And that is what we have done today. This morning, Mr Acting Deputy President, on uh, the ABC AM program, uh, an Indigenous gentleman was uh, speaking about how there are some Australians, some non-Indigenous Australians, who had an understanding of the experience of the stolen generation he referred to the child migrants as, being, as also being stolen, and it's been referred to in this place today. Along with the child migrants, as we know through the Senate inquiry, there are also those, those many Australians who have been institutionalised, taken from their families and placed in institutions. I acknowledge the pain of the child migrants and of the so-called forgotten Australians today and apologise too for the actions of governments that separated them, those children, from their families. Can I say there is more to be done in that area as well? In closing, Mr Acting Deputy President, I want to thank the many Indigenous Australians, Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders, mainly in North Queensland, who have shared their stories and lives with my family and I. I have felt welcome in their homes and in their communities, and I'm grateful for the opportunity and the chance and the generosity that has been shown to me to be able to understand better their lives and their culture. Can I say to those people, and I can't name them all, that their generosity and openness has allowed us, that's my family, to have some understanding of the road that you walk. Mr Acting Deputy President, I am always in awe of the patience of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We know they waited for their vote. They waited for native title, they've waited for education, they've waited for health services. But today's motion means that the wait for the apology to the Australian generation is now over. We are now once again on the path to reconciliation and on the path to closing the gap between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and non-Indigenous Australians. I wholeheartedly support the motion and commit to working to improving outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in Australia. Thank you, Senator McLucas. Uh, Senator Troth. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I also would like to rise to, to support the apology because today is a very important day in the life of this parliament and this country. There is no doubt that much of the past policy was undertaken partly in the name of improving the lives of children, supposedly in material ways of measuring happiness in the thought that they would be removed from their families so that they could have what were seen as better living conditions, better education and with the hope of better eventual employment. But there was no thought given of the family providing an essential underpinning to an individual's emotional life. And that is what we are recognising today amongst other things. 
Over time, there is no doubt that on both sides of government we have attempted to provide practical forms of reconciliation through health, housing, education and employment initiatives. This has been done to the extent that the former government last year spent $4 billion on Indigenous initiatives. And yet many of the indicators which would signal an improvement in those areas have changed very little, such as life expectancy, infant mortality, progress through primary and secondary school and sustainable employment. Saying sorry will not change these conditions in the short term. And yet by acknowledging the emotional scarring that the previous policy has caused, I hope that we are creating a true feeling of partnership to go forward and start to improve living standards in every way. And by living, I don't just mean physical conditions, but anticipating and being able to aspire to a physical and emotional standard of living, which is due to all Australians. As a parent, I can only begin to understand what it would feel like to have one child taken from the family, let alone multiple removals, as so many of these cases seem to be. It is no wonder that so many of those parents spent the rest of their often short lives wondering what had become of their children. They were never to know. Many of these issues have come together in the expressions of regret by various state governments and I was very pleased last year when former Prime Minister John Howard and former Minister Mal Bruff announced what, has been, what is now known as the Northern Territory intervention. And I'm well aware that not everyone agrees with every aspect of that initiative. But what I do hope is that the new Rudd government carries on the practical aspect of this reform. We must act now in concert with state and territory governments to ensure that conditions improve. There have been many expressions of bipartisanship at national government level uh, for some time and especially yesterday and today and I applaud the acceptance of this declaration by the leader of my party, Dr Brendan Nelson. Let us go on with this so that the succeeding generations can note this declaration at the start of this new parliament as the start of a new era and new partnerships. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I rise uh, to speak on the motion of apology that is before the chamber. And can I say uh, what an historic moment it is that this federal parliament has finally done what ought to have been done. Uh, many years ago, and that is to apologise to Indigenous Australians for this long chapter in our history where people were taken away from their families. Uh, I wanted to just speak briefly, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, about some of the reasons why I believe this apology is so important. Uh, in my first speech to this place, I spoke about the need for compassion and why compassion was, to my way of thinking, uh, the driver or ought be the driver uh, for those of us who are in public life. It ought be uh, that uh, which those who have power uh, remember and seek to implement uh, when engaging in their activities. Uh, and I said that uh, this notion of compassion really was that which lay at the heart of a truly civilised society. I also made the point that compassion is what underscores our relationships with one another and that which enables us to come to a place of community, even in our diversity. Uh, that is a view which I have had for all of my life, or as far as I can recall, perhaps not when I was born, but certainly for all of the, the, my time where I've actually thought about these issues. And it is very much the reason why I have always been, since this issue was raised, an advocate for an apology, because it is an expression an expression uh, not only of regret but also of apology uh, that enables us uh, to come to a place of community. Uh, it demonstrates an understanding of what was done, of the impact of what was done, uh, and enables us to move forward. Uh, during uh, the years uh, of the Howard government, the former Howard government, 
Uh, I was engaged uh, uh, for some part of that in various anti-racism activities at a community level, and in the context of that, uh, I once interviewed Loitra O'Donoghue in a public forum uh, in which she uh, talked about her experience. Uh, and I have to say my experience on that day uh, was one of the more profoundly moving experiences uh, that I have had, uh, where this woman of extraordinary achievement uh, and extraordinary intellect and extraordinary integrity spoke about what it meant for her to have been taken away. Uh, for those of you who do not know, uh, Louisa O'Donoghue uh, was taken away from her mother at the age of two. Uh, she, uh, from memory, uh, was one of the people or young uh, children who was taken eventually to Colebrook, which uh, was a home in the Adelaide Hills, actually not far uh, from where I lived when I came to Australia from Malaysia. Uh, and Noetis uh, gave uh, all the people in the audience that day an extraordinary insight into what that meant for her and what that meant uh, and what it meant for her not to have seen her mother, I think, for some three and something decades, around about 33 years. Uh, the thing that I remember most about that discussion was not just uh, the uh, sadness of the story that was being told. The thing I remember most was the extraordinary dignity and spirit of forgiveness uh, that uh, uh, Ms O'Donoghue spoke with. Uh, and this, to be honest uh, with the Chamber, has been a hallmark of much of the activity I engaged in before I, became to Parliament, before I came into Parliament uh, on anti-racism and other issues. I have been struck uh, over and over again uh, by the big-heartedness of our Indigenous peoples. Uh, when dealing with non-Indigenous Australians, how much uh, forgiveness uh, has, there has been in the way in which uh, they've dealt with me and with others. Uh, and I've often thought, if I had been in the same situation and had that sort of history, uh, that I think my anger uh, and bitterness would probably not have enabled me to behave in the ways they did. Uh, and I have so often uh, been humbled uh, by the uh, dignity, uh, forgiveness and, as I said, big-heartedness of the, so many Indigenous peoples with whom I have worked over the years. Uh, so I speak in support of this motion. Uh, first, obviously, as uh, someone in this chamber as an elected representative, but also I want to uh, very express my strong personal commitment uh, and uh, gladness that we have come to this place. Uh, because, as I said before, uh, I do believe that it is this understanding of the experience of others uh, which enables us to come to a place of community in our diversity. Uh, diversity is a good thing. It is a characteristic of Australian society which has enriched us, uh, and it is a characteristic which I believe does contribute to a strong, vibrant community. Uh, but in order to ensure that diversity has its most positive manifestation, uh, I believe uh, we must try and understand what it is like for others who are different to ourselves. Uh, so indigenous, non-Indigenous Australia, uh, I think, does need to come <coughs> to a place where we have a better understanding of what life has been like currently and in the past for our, our Indigenous brothers and sisters. Uh, this is not the day for uh, much partisan politics, and uh, I do commend the opposition after some uh, public comments indicating disquiet on this issue for eventually supporting uh, this motion. I did want to make uh, a couple of brief points about comments made by the Leader of the Opposition in this place uh, in his response uh, on behalf of the Opposition. He made first the point uh, that uh, we ought not judge uh, previous actions by contemporary standards. Uh, and that is something I, I have heard said by those in the <coughs> former government. Uh, that is uh, something I've heard said by those who oppose the notion of an apology. Can I say that uh, it is true at, that over time uh, human societies develop different notions about what is right and wrong, what is socially or uh, acceptable? Uh, that is obviously uh, part of, of what is great uh, about, about us. We do move forward and we do change. Uh, but I want to emphasise this. There are some things which were never right. 
There are some things which, no matter what time in history, uh, no matter what time uh, they, they have occurred, they are simply wrong. Uh, and to try in any way to suggest that because something occurred in the past when people thought, some people thought differently, because some parliaments thought differently, because some policies were different, to some way suggest that in any way diminishes uh, the moral wrongness of what occurred, I think is incorrect. The second point I wanted to make in relation to the comments by Senator Minchin and, frankly, by a number of opposition senators is this. There was a lot of discussion about the process and criticism of uh, the Prime Minister's release of the apology and so forth. Uh, can I say, on a day where we are talking about what has happened over many decades in this country to a group of people because they were black, because they were indigenous, for people to be so self-absorbed as to be concerned about uh, their own uh, processes, I think, really does uh, demonstrate a level of self-absorption that is extraordinary. It would seem, from some of the comments made in this place, that what was happening inside the coalition party room uh, seemed to be of more importance uh, than the enormity of what has been done today. As I said, uh, this is uh, a motion that has been a long time coming. This is a motion which uh, ought to have been dealt with in this place before. Uh, it is a regret, I think, for many people in Australia that for so many years we, uh, we failed to see the importance of this symbolic gesture in order to move forward. Uh, I hope that in the years to come we can look at this time and say this was a time uh, where we, in this parliament, on behalf of the community who elects us, and more importantly when the broader Australian community, could acknowledge and apologise for past wrongs, and that we then moved forward to do something very different. Uh, nobody who has argued for symbolic <coughs> uh, gestures, uh, symbolic uh, moments such as this, believes that they are the only things we must do. Clearly there are many practical measures which we have to put in place to redress the unacceptable disadvantage so many of our Indigenous brothers and sisters <coughs> suffer. Uh, but symbolism and ideas is impor are important. Uh, we all know that. We are all members of political parties who are not just about practical plans. They are also very much about ideas, uh, about philosophies and about what we feel in our hearts is right for this nation and for this community. Uh, and today what we have done is stated as a parliament what we believe is right, that we should say sorry. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to support this motion taking note of the apology given in this place and the other place today, and I do so with great pleasure to make a contribution to this debate on this historic occasion. Mr Acting Deputy President, we as people can be terrible and flawed creatures at times. We can inflict harms that make most cringe. We can do wrongs that we dare not speak of, and we can inflict willful pain on each other and the environment around us. However, thankfully, very few are guilty of inflicting such willful, deliberate acts of pain. Most of us, when we inflict pain or harms, are often ignorant of the pain we are causing at the time. Most of us act with the best of intentions, however right, wrong or misguided those intentions may be at that time or proved to be in future years and retrospection. Today this parliament has taken a stand and apologised for wrongs of the past committed against the Indigenous peoples of Australia. We have made this expression of sorrow for both the harms inflicted willfully by some and for the inadvertent or unintended harms of many. As the Liberal Party leader in the other place said in his, I thought, very moving and worthwhile contribution to the apology, each generation lives in ignorance of the long-term consequences of its decisions and actions. Even when motivated by inherent humanity and decency to reach out to the dispossessed in extreme adversity, our actions can have 
unintended consequences. Well, consequences both unintended and, sadly, in some cases intended, certainly did cause harms and wrongs to many of our Indigenous peoples over the years. They were recognised in the historic Bringing Them Home report released in 1997. And whilst it has taken some time, today this place has done the right thing. And although I may wish it had been done earlier, I am very proud to be a member of the parliament that has said, I believe, very genuinely, very deeply and overwhelmingly in very heartfelt and sincere terms that we are sorry for those wrongs that have been committed. We have heard many comments made in this place and elsewhere reciting stories out of the reports of bringing them home, very tragic and personal stories of forcibly removed children from loving families, the fact that many people lost touch with their culture <coughs> or background, others who were forced into child labour, some, sadly, who were beaten or sexually abused. These are the challenges that generations of Indigenous people have faced and have brought to bear in coming to where we are today. And as little wonder against that backdrop and many other challenges and issues over the years that we see the extent of despair and adversity and disadvantage that exists across our Indigenous communities. I hope today, as I said earlier in this place, will not just mark an expression of sorrow but mark the beginning of healing, a process of forgiveness and, most importantly, an opportunity to move forward. I know, like many, that our Indigenous communities are suffering very deeply. In my role prior to coming to this place, working at the Winemakers Federation of Australia, I spent time in trying to grapple with issues of alcohol and substance abuse, travelling around Alice Springs and the town camps nearby with officers of the Northern Territory Liquor Licensing Commission. And in those trips and those days, it became very clear to me, of course, not just the harms being created as a result of that direct abuse, but the fact that that abuse was a result of many wrongs committed over the years of the dispossession of people from having a sense of hope and a sense of future about their lives. It is, I hope, in delivering some sense of closure today on part and very broadly worded in this motion many other aspects of the tragic history of our relationship with Indigenous Australia that we can achieve that progress and can ensure that Today's Indigenous people, and most importantly the generations that are to come, can enjoy hope and opportunity and feel a sense of worthwhile and well-being in our community. We as a parliament and parliamentarians need to make today really stand as a proud day in our history. And we will only do that if the current government and future governments back today's words up with action. The symbolism of today must go hand in hand with true, meaningful, practical steps. We must ensure that the investment is there to genuinely tackle the ills in Aboriginal communities, the disadvantages in health care, in education standards, the need for policing and a stop to the abuse and violence that we have seen reported so widely in our Aboriginal communities. It's a challenge that many governments, of course, through our Federation, have sadly failed to meet. That failure is reflected in the statistics and in the lives of many broken people in Aboriginal communities. It is a challenge now that falls upon the shoulders of the new government and on each of us as parliamentarians to ensure that policies and actions actually follow up 
with the very great words that will have been spoken in this place and the other place today. So I would urge in making this contribution the new government to make sure that they don't feel that this symbolic step is enough, because it will not be. It is important. I hope it is a great step, but I hope it is the first of many steps to deliver a strong and proud future for our Indigenous peoples. In my first speech to this place, just a few months ago last year, I spoke of the hope that I would be able to see and help make a contribution to Indigenous peoples who were free of suppression, paternalism or welfareism, and instead who enjoyed incentive, respect and opportunity. Today I think we have shown enormous respect in this place, and I am very proud to have seen that occur. But there is much to be done to ensure that the incentive and opportunity that I spoke of is there as well. I note that I'm not the only person to have referred back to their first speech, and though mine was more recent than most in here, I note Senator Wong and Senator Payne and others have referenced their first speeches in relation to their commitment to healing the wounds in Indigenous Australia and creating advantage and opportunity. Well, if so many of us have made that commitment in what is perhaps our most important speech in this place, our first speech in this place, I hope that we can genuinely see that commitment through in the same type of bipartisan, well-meaning and well-spirited manner that we have today, because that's what our Indigenous peoples need and indeed we will be a much prouder and a much stronger country if today's steps can be taken forward into the future to deliver the hope and opportunity that I hope future Indigenous peoples can have. Senator Lundy. Uh, thank you, um, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we find ourselves on in this federal parliament, and I support the motion taking note. Today, Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, on behalf of the Parliament of Australia, said sorry to Indigenous Australians for past injustices they had experienced as a result of previous government policies. Prime Minister Rudd recognised the devastating impact of previous government policies on families of the stolen generation, the dislocation and displacement of whole communities, and he did so in a way that I think encompassed all of the pain across not just those affected directly but their families, their extended families and indeed the long-term impact on whole communities, an impact that continues today. Saying sorry has been a long time coming and I know many people in this place and many, many more outside of this place have dreamed of this day, have worked long and hard to make it happen through their own compassion and activism leading towards this moment. I'd like to acknowledge those efforts of everybody who, from the bottom of their hearts, has worked towards a positive outcome of a genuine apology emanating from the Prime Minister of this country. It is a historic moment uh, for the healing of the nation. It's as, it's as though the warmth and optimism that I felt um, coming into Parliament House today uh, has permeated the community right around the country. There's obviously some scepticism, some questions, what happens next? Of course, that's appropriate. But I was truly inspired by that warmth and optimism that I think was tangible in the building this morning and I think has been reflected in the extraordinarily gracious generosity of the acceptance of that apology by Indigenous people. I think it's a day from which we can move forward. I have great hope myself and optimism for that. 
I think under the inspired stewardship of Kevin Rudd, and I also acknowledge the very committed work by our Minister for Indigenous Affairs, Jenny Macklin, in making this a priority for this first sitting of the 42nd Parliament. Uh, there are undisputed facts, as reported in the Stolen Generations report. Little children are sacred. And now those facts are firmly imprinted on our collective consciousness. And it's for those facts that today we are saying sorry. We know between 1910 and 1970, between, between 10 and 30% of Indigenous children were forcibly taken from their parents. For those of us who've heard the stories firsthand, it's an incredibly emotional experience and one that I think everybody should be able to listen to firsthand because it's that compelling telling of those stories that makes it real for all of us, that makes it real as though we can never share the pain directly, but it makes it real in a way that we all do acknowledge and accept some responsibility. It was, of course, the product of deliberate, calculated policies of the state at the time. The powers to take the children away were provided by the parliaments of the day, explicit powers provided under statute. These, this whole experience should make us very humble as legislators. We've seen the harm that misguided policies can cause, and we have Im immense responsibility to stand up and acknowledge these mistakes, as we have today, as well as celebrate the successes. And the apology is, as I think everyone is saying, including the Prime Minister, a first step. The Rudd Labor government is committed to reducing the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians with respect to health, education, life expectancy. These policies will no doubt be challenging to implement. To improve health in a genuine, sustainable, long-term, holistic manner requires attention to and investment in the social determinants of health. Housing, education, employment, obviously health services, but the physical environment and individual and collective and community self-esteem. This gamut of public policy challenges is fortunately an area that we in Australia have a great deal of expertise in. In fact, many of our states do have the capacity to provide, I think, the professional guidance, support, public policy inspiration we need to make a real difference. What's been lacking in the area of health promotion public policy has been a genuine commitment by the federal government, by the former federal government, to see fit to deploy those resources in a focused and unrelenting way towards a problem that still exists to our shame. And that is the health status of our Indigenous population. Let's hope we won't have to wait as long to report back positively about the impact of the changes of those policies, the outcomes of investment in education, employment opportunities and health status. Let's hope that this agenda will continue to attract the sort of bipartisan support that I'm hearing echoing back across the chamber today from most, not all, because that gives us all great heart that this really is going to be a concerted effort, not one divided by the partisan politics of opportunism, but one inspired by the opportunity to rectify a great wrong.
The weight that lays across, has laid across our collective conscious has been lifted slightly in one corner. We have a way to go, and I think together all Australians, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, will be able to stand tall and walk together um, with this weight lifted at some point in the future. For my part, I'm proud to be part of the moment. Um, I'm proudest of Indigenous people who have lived their lives with great dignity, who found themselves as part of this um, um, formality today in the federal parliament of our Prime Minister finally saying sorry. In closing, Mr Acting Deputy President, I'd also like to acknowledge um, the wonderful initiative in having a welcome to country ceremony at the op opening of parliament, prior to the opening of parliament yesterday. It's a, a, a long-standing tradition, I know, in other houses of parliament and uh, has been a feature of public events in Canberra for a very long time. Um, the lack of that presence here in Parliament House stood out, was glaring. It's now been fixed and I too would like to acknowledge the bipartisan support for that continuing tradition. And I'd like to thank <coughs> Matilda House and the elders um, for their participation in a wonderful ceremony that I think will set the tone um, for that tradition to continue in the future. Senator McGarrah. Um, I speak Sorry. to the motion before the Senate on our national apology that both Houses of Parliament supported um, today and accompanied by uh, the great national fanfare and feeling. I accept that the people the Australian people in the greater majority want this parliament to come together to settle this uh, long-standing matter. And to this end, I express my heartfelt support for the words and feelings in the National Apology, uh, which in part reads that uh, to the mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters for the breaking up of families and communities, we say sorry and for the indignity and degradation thus inflicted on a proud people and a proud culture, we say sorry. For the future, we take heart, resolving that this new page in history of our great continent can now be written, a future where all Australians, whatever their origins, are truly equal partners with equal opportunities and with an equal stake in shaping the next chapter in the history of this great country. Australia. Uh, the national apology, while accepted as, an Im as important symbolism, uh, it will nevertheless, we trust, have th the very practical effect of healing much of the hurt, pain and anger of those that say that they or their family members were taken from their family origins at a young age for no other reason than race. And that is what we are apologising for today. That is what we are sorry for today. Uh, therefore, it's worthy to note, as has been recognised by previous speakers, uh, that the national apology in no way must blanket the history of the good work and good intentions of so many churches and welfare groups uh, that helped Aboriginal children um, from their settlements who were in dire need of help. Um, and so the difference ought to be made between the two. And in no way dims the apology, uh, but we, make, we, we do set out the differences in what is a complex issue. And it is probably best put by Noel Pearson, um, an Aboriginal elder known to all in this chamber, uh, in a, a very fine and thoughtful piece he made in the Australian newspaper on Tuesday, February the 12th. And, uh, I quote uh, that part of the article, which I recommend to everyone in the Senate, but that part of the article that, that relates to the point I'm making here about the churches. Uh, to quote Noel Pearson, the truth is the removal of Aboriginal children and the breaking up of Aboriginal families is a history of complexity and great variety. People, are uh, people were stolen, people were rescued, people were brought in chains, 
people were brought by their parents, mixed blood children were in danger from their tribal stepfathers, while others were loved and treated as their own, people were in danger from whites, and people were protected by whites. The motivations and actions of those whites involved in this history, governments and missions, range from cruel to caring, malign to loving, well-intentioned to evil. And he says, Noel Pearson goes on to say, the 19-year-old Bavarian missionary who came to the year-old Lutheran mission at Cape Bedford in Cape York Peninsula in 1887 and who, were, and who would spend more than 50 years of his life underwriting the future of um, Noel Pearson's people, uh, in Noel Pearson's words, cannot but be a hero to me and to my people. We owe an un unpayable debt to George Schwartz and the white people who supported my grandparents and others to rebuild their lives after they arrived at the mission as young children in 1910. So uh, that is a most significant point in, in, in what Noel Pearson says and we, we, we all concede is a complex issue and uh, really is more eloquently put than what I thought was the Prime Minister's very smart aleck remark uh, in the chamber today in, in relation to what he said was uh, a very crude post-Reformation theology way uh, of, of re resolving the, the differences in the churches. It was nothing of the sort. I venture to say it was nothing of the sort. It had nothing to do with theological differences or the Reformation, the post-Reformation. It was, it was either a tongue-in-cheek or a smart aleck remark by the Prime Minister, unwarranted on, on a day like this. And it was a cheap shot, a cheap shot at the churches. Um, equally, I'd also say that, uh, talking about cheap shots, the, uh, many, as I am informed on the news wires, that uh, many of the staffers of the Labor Party, uh, no doubt caught on film, um, were party to turning their back on Brendan Nelson's speech. That's right. That's right, says my colleagues. Uh, on the grounds, on the grounds that, that Brendan Nelson raised the issue of the Northern Territory uh, intervention. That was the reason that they, they, they decided to turn their back on uh, what, what uh, is, was a bipartisan approach to this from, uh, um, in regard to saying sorry. Um, so before they you know, are so pleased and trumpeting their own compassion in, in this matter, I make this point also, that the Labor Party may be feeling rather chuffed with itself. In, in relation to this, particularly those, I, well, I refer to those that have turned their back, you know, that, that uh, played the, poli the game of politics r right to the end. But I, I, I am convinced that this matter of uh, ap apology uh, is, is not a case of a change in political landscape of a new government that has brought in this policy. I think the political landscape changed uh, before the election, well before the election. It changed when, in fact, we introduced when we introduced the Northern Territory Emergency Action. It was then that the Australian people, in the greater majority, decided that having seen this most definite practical action by, from the government or from the parliament, if you like, because it was supported by, 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 by the parliament, but when the Australian people saw this practical action being taken, for what probably the majority thought uh, w that were once against an apology, that were uh, cynical of an apology, thought it was just very hollow uh, and, and had no real meaning. Once they saw the, the practical action being taken, I think that's when the real landscape changed. That's when, the, when there was a sea change. And we felt it. We felt it when we were in government. We actually no, uh, felt the, the, the change where the greater majority of Australians uh, believed that an apology was, was now due and was now really quite acceptable because it combined itself. It, w it went along with the, with the strong practical action. So I make that point. I think the sea change came from the Australian people and the greater majority of the Australian people 
uh, wanted an apology, accepted the apology for what they once were probably very, very cynical against, due to the strong action in regard to the Northern Territory uh, emergency action. Um, so it would be a tragedy. Be a tragedy if that action was unwound. Um, it has been a success. It, ha it has been a, a marked success, with uh, over five and a half thousand children now having health checks in 48 communities. Just to quote one figure, probably the most significant of them all. But the foundation stone to which that action has been built upon. To, to, to pull this foundation stone out endangers the whole action and its success, and that is the permit system. And the other side must know that. They must know it is the most practical action. The ability to have a success in the Northern Territory um, emergency action comes from the abolition of the permit system. Yet the government are using it as a symbol. They have reinstated it as a symbol, is my judgment. To the left. They have reinstated it, what has been the most practical action in Aboriginal affairs for many decades has, has, uh, has been unwound. And it would be a tragedy if anything more was done, if you weren't genuine, if you did cave in now to what I see on the news services, pressure about uh, unwinding that whole, that, that whole Northern Territory action. And if it's and if, if you think I'm over dramatising it, when you get staff members, when you get Order. staff members turning Order. their back on the leader Order. of the opposition on the grounds Order. he raises Senator. the issue. Order. Senator's time has expired. Senator Senator Brown. I also rise to speak in relation to the Prime Minister Kevin Rudd's momentous and long overdue apology to the stolen generation. Indigenous Australians who were sadly victims of one of the most shameful chapters of our nation's history. Last year, Mr Rudd made the commitment that if the Labor Party was to form government, that, would he, that he would take this important and historical step and say sorry to the stolen generation for the pain and suffering they endured as a result of being forcibly separated from their families. Today, he delivered on this commitment. Our Prime Minister said sorry on behalf of the government, on behalf of the Australian Parliament, on behalf of the Australian people. The significance of this important moment in our nation's history should not be downplayed or lost. For many thousands of Indigenous, indigenous Australians, both with us and past, this day has been a long time coming. Indeed, for the past 10 years, the possibility of an apology has all but eluded us. However, the election of the Rudd Labor government last year not only put the issue back on the agenda, as we have seen in the last couple of days, it's placed the apology to the stolen generation at the very top of the agenda. The significance of this event we've, we've no doubt be resounding for ye years to come, but for now its present and fresh importance should not be lost. It should be enjoyed and celebrated. The atmosphere in that parliament house over the last two days has come to symbolise the immediate meaning of this event. There has been necessary reflection and acknowledgement of the past, but also a sense of hope for the future. To me, this is the most basic and true meaning of reconciliation, a sincere and heartfelt acknowledgement of what has come before and a genuine desire to move forward together toward the future. The apology today was an acknowledgement of a past wrong. It also represented a clear statement of our desire as a nation to move forward as one people. However, the Rudd Labor government acknowledges that the events of today are only the first step of many steps that need to be taken to mend the past injustices suffered by the Indigenous people. Much more needs to be done to bridge the gap that has been allowed to develop over a number of years between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. As the Prime Minister stated today, in this country, we are about a fair go for all, and up until now this sentiment has failed to be applied when it comes to Indigenous Australians. The facts speak for themselves. Lower life expectancy, poor health and education outcomes—these people have done it tough. However, 
The Prime Minister also stated today that the Rudd Labor government is committed to improving outcomes for Indigenous communities from this point on. The Prime Minister acknowledged that most of the old approaches are not working and that there, needs to be, there, is, there is a need for a new beginning based on consultative, tailored and local approaches to improving outcomes in areas such as health and education in Indigenous communities. The Rudd Labor government has already committed to a number of policies aimed directly at improving health and education outcomes for, many, for young Indigenous children, the future of the Indigenous people, heritage and culture, the future of our country. I am extremely proud to be a member of the Australian Parliament that finally took the important step of acknowledging the wrongs suffered by members of the stolen generation and that, and that has set a positive agenda towards wor working towards closing the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. Today the first words have been smoke spoken and the first words and the first steps have been taken on the road towards reconciliation. Let this day rest in the minds of all Australians as one of hope. Senator Heffernan. Thanks very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, today is a great day for all Australians, um, and I suppose you could say it's a new dawn for the original custodians of Australia. I mean, I'm a farmer, and occasionally I pretend that I own a farm, and in fact I'm only the custodian of the farm. So, and if, even if you live a long time, Mr Deputy Chairman, you actually don't live very long. And this is where this, this is just a great new opportunity for all Australians, and I am very proud of the fact that uh, Australians have displayed great generosity of spirit. Today is the day for, for our Indigenous people, or as I in the back country say, my blackfellow mates. It's not a whitefellow day. I'm not interested in some of the disadvantage where if you go to you know, different parts of Australia you'll see th third generation unemployed white fellows that are you know, in pretty dire circumstances. Today is a great day for Australia to display its generosity. And I, I'm not interested in the nuances of where, who, who got what to who. I mean, the whole thing, ever since we got here, has been a national disgrace. And uh, you know, white fella habits have inflicted great pain on a lot of our Indigenous people. So I can only say thank God we've got here. Um, my view is that the people, and the, you know, there are people that have a different view, uh, are innocently ignorant of what's gone on in the past. And there are a lot of people like that. I mean, when I left school, I didn't know that at Kudamundra, 30 miles from where I lived, there was a place full of, as it were, taken away young girls. And uh, we had no idea. So you can be innocently ignorant of the facts. There are some people, and you can pick it by the language, or some you can pick by the silence, that are using, that are passengers of political convenience in this particular issue, who are, are not in favour of it. And there are people who, in my view, are just simply moral cowards. And so, with all human endeavour, there is human failure. And sure, some of the things that have been put together over the years haven't worked out as they should have. But as, as the senators opposite would know and the senators on this side would know, you can go out into any remote community now and things are not like they ought to be. The position in some of these communities are still a continuing national disgrace. But if today is going to help heal not only people who are seriously disadvantaged directly by what's gone on in the past, um, um, but also by raising their self-esteem and seeing the display of generosity of spirit of the wider Australian community, I think today is just a magnificent day for everyone to celebrate. And, uh, and it was a great pleasure for me to see today people with smiles on their faces around this place. Um, 
Sure, one size doesn't fit all. I mean, you go out into some remote communities, and there are still remote communities that want to live traditionally. I mean, they might want to live traditionally with a land cruiser to assist them, but they still want to live traditionally and share their goods with all the neighbourhood and all the rest of it. That's fair enough. There are a lot of people who want to leave something in their will. That is Indigenous people, just the same as white fellows, who, if they get the opportunity, they want to better themselves and leave a better situation for their children. And I mean, I just think it's we've got to aspire to all the things that have been repeated many times in this place about education, health, and all the other things. But we've got to aspire to putting people in a position where they can own their own home on their own country and leave that home in their will to their kids. It's a pretty simple aspiration, but it's a great builder of spirit. And um, I have to say, oh, I'm, pretty, um, I'm pretty upbeat about the future for our Indigenous people. And as I say, for uh, you know, ever since the 1700s, they've got a pretty, I won't swear, I'm in the chamber, pretty rotten deal. And, you know, for various reasons of which I'm not interested. Today is the day of celebration. But I have to say that if you analyse the science of Australia, the weather, and what's happening with climate change and the predictions of declining runoff in the south, somewhere between 3,500 and 11,000 gigalitres of less runoff in the Murray-Darling Basin, which has a total of 23,000 gigalitres and produces 40 per cent of our food from water and 70 per cent including the dry land. And then you look at the north, where we're the only island continent, Mr De Acting Deputy Chairman, that in my view globally is going to deal with climate change. And I know this is a long way from this particular motion, but it's certainly where it's going to finish up. And I mean, in 50 years' time, the science is right and 50 per cent of the world's population is water poor and a billion people are unable to feed themselves and 1.6 billion people are displaced by climate change and 30 per cent of the productive land of Asia disappears and the food task doubles, then if Australia can maintain its sovereignty, the new wealth creators, Mr Acting Deputy Chairman, are going to be our Indigenous people. Because gladly they own, for instance, in the Northern Territory, 45 per cent of the land mass. A lot of that land mass is going to be greatly enhanced by climate change if the science is right. And as I've said in this chamber before, at the present time, despite the fact that and the ILC, the ILC is a wonderful opportunity for enhancement by our Indigenous people. They own many, many great properties in Australia, scattered right across the top end as well as the south end. And we have a duty of care to our Indigenous people to make sure that they are the beneficiaries of this new wealth that will come and that a bunch of shysters and crooks don't intercept it all. So I am greatly gladdened by recent events. I'm not interested in the intricacies or the nuances of, of the language. I just think it's a great day for all Australians. And I am so pleased to see um, our Indigenous people celebrating that as well as our white fellows. And I went as Senator Moore did today to see the people that feel that things in the Northern Territory aren't what they ought to be. And, you, and what that said to me, Senator Moore, was that uh, all human endeavour has some human failure. One size does not fit all. And I mean, obviously, there are serious problems, and I'm not going to go through the problems now because today's a day of celebration. And, uh, I am mightily proud <coughs> to have had the privilege to be in a parliament that did what we did today. I just think that's a great privilege. And like most things in life, you don't really appreciate them till they've passed you by. And uh, I am so proud of everyone in this place today and the wider generosity of spirit of the Australian people. And it's no more complicated than that. Thank you very much. Keep going. Oh, uh, I've got to keep going. Have I just for a couple of minutes? Um, well, I, I would hope. I would hope that the people out at Wat Air see light at the end of the tunnel. Um, that Tobias, who's the acting, who's the associate principal out there, that today has gladdened his heart. I mean, when you see. 
kids that have no school to go to, that want to go to school. Um, it's a great thing that the government has listened to the concerns of the people at Wadia. They've, they've now got a Centrelink person on the office instead of a phone in the hole in the wall. Um, I think they're all sort of little indicators that Australia is waking up to the rotten deal our Indigenous people have gotten. And I mean, as there's an old saying, you shouldn't walk a mile in my shoes. I mean, the critics who are, in my view, innocently ignorant of the facts ought to try walking a mile in the, their shoes. I mean, a lot of the people I am. I felt like knuckling a few people out there. I struck a bloke out there and who had a, thousands of cattle on an indigenous property, and I won't repeat the rotten deal the indigenous people got out of it, but I felt like smacking him in the ear. Um, those things we want to put behind us, and we want, to, we want to make sure that the people of our indigenous communities, who are the original custodians of Australia and whose heritage is the most precious thing that Australia's got, that want to live traditionally, are allowed to live traditionally, and those that want to go off and become doctors, lawyers and Indian chiefs can do that too. So this is a very complex matter, uh, but it is a day of celebration, and uh, I'm not the least bit interested in anyone— Order. The honourable senator's time has expired. God. It being almost 6.50 p.m., we now move to the consideration of government documents. I'll identify the documents on today's notice paper individually first, and then we'll move to the uh, general notice paper and move through those documents uh, page by page, because there's quite a number of them. Firstly, the Attorney General's Department, Australian Government Solicitor, Statement of Corporate Intent, 0708. Attorney General's Department, National Security Information Criminal and Civil Proceedings Act, 2004. Non-disclosure and witness exclusion certificates, annual reports. Item 3, Medibank Private, Statement of Corporate Intent, 2008-2010. Item 4, Department of Innovation, Industry, Science and Research, AAF Investments Proprietary Limited, AAFCM Investments Proprietary Limited, AAF BioVentures Proprietary Limited, IWF Foundation Proprietary Limited, AAF Neo Proprietary Limited, annual reports, 2006-07. Item 5, Department of Health and Ageing, Office of the Gene Technology Regulator Quarterly Report, July to September 07. Item 6, Department of Health and Ageing, National Blood Authority, Annual Report 06 07. Item 7, Department of Broadband Communications and the, Info and the Digital Economy, Australian Broadcasting Corporation Equity and Diversity, Annual Report 06 07. Item 8, Attorney General's Department, Australian Commission for Law, Enforcement, Integrity, Assumed Identities, Annual Report 0607. Senator Parry. Thank you, Mr. 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 Acting Deputy President. Uh, I move to take note of that report and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Leave granted. No objection, leave is granted. Item 9, Attorney General's Department, Copyright Agency Limited, Annual Report 0607. Senator Parry. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I also seek, uh, move to take note of uh, that report. And seek leave to continue my remarks. Leave granted. Being no objection, leave is granted. Item 11, Attorney General's Department. Sorry, item 10, Attorney General's Department Screen Rights Annual Report 0607. Senator Parry. Thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I also uh, move to take note of that report and seek leave to continue my remarks. Leave granted. Being no objection, leave is granted. Item 11, Attorney General's Department Telecommunications Interception Act 1979 Report to ending 30th of June 07. Senator Parry. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I also uh, move to take note of that report and seek leave to continue my remarks. Leave. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. Item 12, Attorney General's Department Surveillance Devices Act 2004, report for the year ending 30 June 07. Senator Parry. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Again, I, seek, I move to uh, take note of that report and seek leave to continue my remarks. Leave granted. No objection. Leave is granted. Item 13, Attorney General's Department, Australian Law Reform Commission, Report Number 107, Privilege in Perspectives, Client Legal Privilege on Federal Investigations. Senator Parry. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Again, I move to take note of that report and seek leave to continue my remarks. Leave granted. No objection. Leave is granted. Item 14, Department of Immigration and Citizenship, response to Ombudsman's statements made under Section 4860 of the Migration Act. 
Senator Bartlett. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I move to take note of uh, this response um, and will speak to it. Uh, this uh, is one, the latest in a long line of reports from the Immigration Ombudsman and responses from the Immigration Minister, but it, of course, is the first one um, where the response is from Minister under the new uh, Labor government. Uh, and the Minister, Senator Chris Evans, who I uh, congratulate for uh, uh, to being appointed to that extremely important role. Uh, senators would recall that uh, the relevant section of the Migration Act 4860, 4860 rather, uh, was put in place a couple of years ago following um, a fair bit of agitation from a number of uh, backbenchers in the then government, most notably uh, the member for Kuyong, Mr Giorgio. Uh, which required the Ombudsman to investigate every uh, case of uh, long-term detention, every person who was in immigration detention for over a year. And I should remind the Senate and the community that people in immigration detention have, been, uh, charged, have not been charged, let alone convicted, with uh, any offence. It is so-called administrative detention, uh, which leads to people being jailed, uh, at least in the, these cases, for a year um, uh, or more. Uh, the minister's response uh, relates to uh, 154 uh, assessments uh, made by the uh, um, Commonwealth Ombudsman, the Immigration Ombudsman, and uh, I do note and welcome the remarks of the new minister expressing his serious concern that so many detention cases have taken so long to resolve. Now, this is uh, over two years since this section was put in the Immigration Act. It was meant to be uh, assuaging people's concerns about the large numbers of people who are in administrative detention, jailed in effect for years and years without charge uh, or even accusation of any wrongdoing. Uh, so uh, the clear impression given at that time was we will investigate all the existing cases and we will ensure that uh, try to minimise the likelihood of people in future being in immigration detention for prolonged periods of time. But as the minister's response notes, um, Twelve of the individuals referred to in the uh, Ombudsman statement uh, tabled uh, alongside this remain in immigration detention, and he also notes that an additional 61 people currently in immigration detention have been detained for longer than two years. Uh, so it is important to continue to draw attention to the fact detailed through these uh, reports, and this is just the latest in a long line, uh, that prolonged uh, outrageously prolonged uh, jailing of people uh, who have been charged with no crime, let alone convicted, who are not even accused of any uh, breach of the law, uh, continues. It continues to this day. It is continuing now. 61 people in immigration detention for two years or more. Uh, and these are not all asylum seekers, um, I should add. Uh, there is um, a range of reasons why people end up in immigration detention, uh, and the key issue and the key concern of the community, which was so strong uh, that it led to that uh, widely publicised backbench revolt, uh, has dissipated since that time, I believe, in part because people assume that the problem no longer exists. But the problem does still exist, and I welcome the fact that the new minister has specifically in his response uh, indicated his serious concern uh, that so many of these cases have taken so long to resolve and that uh, there is such a number of people and should be nobody. Nobody should be jailed without charge or trial for years at a time. That is simply an abomination. Yet we have 61 people who have been in administrative detention, immigration detention, for two years or more. Uh, uh, so I, I welcome the uh, minister's indication. Uh, of his desire to try and resolve these cases quickly, and uh, that is uh, a positive move. It is a, a different uh, type of comment to that was uh, attached to these statements uh, in the past from previous ministers. Um, and I note with most of these that are detailed here, uh, the people that were investigated who had been locked up for prolonged periods who have uh, got out were given permanent protection visas, uh, meaning they were refugees all along. Uh, so they suffered that enormous amount of unnecessary trauma of long-term detention and great taxpayer expense, I might say, uh, and yet ended up being, um, being given visas at the end of it all anyway. 
uh, and I'd uh, seek leave to continue my remarks. Leave granted. Being no objection, leave is granted. Let's move to item 15, Department of Immigration and Citizenship. Uh, report for tabling in Parliament by the Commonwealth Immigration Ombudsman, Section 4860 of the Migration Act 58. Now, there's been, I think, Senator Bartlett. Also, if I could, or is unless someone else also keen to speak to it? Um, to take note of reports one to six, um, which we neglected to, uh, to indicate taking leave and, um, earlier on in the uh, <coughs> earlier on. Yes, I, I, okay? I was wanting to finish off item 15. I didn't realise Senator Bartlett was also going no, to speak to that, and then I was going to return to that. But in the, okay. in the light of Senator Bartlett wishing to speak to 15, we'll, we'll uh, meet with your request, okay. Senator Sherry. To have leave? Leave granted. Being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Sherry. I, I would uh, move to take uh, note of reports one to six and um, uh, I think take leave, is it? Seek leave Seek to continue your remarks. To continue my remarks. Leave Thank granted. You. Being no objection, leave is granted. We are now back to item 15. Senator Bartlett. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I move to take note of this document and uh, also will speak to that. Uh, this is rather weightier. Um, I guess uh, not able to transmit through Hansard the, uh, the size of it, but uh, it is um, about 100 and, uh, 130 or so cases investigated by the Immigration Ombudsman. So these are the actual details of each individual case. Uh, obviously in five minutes I'm not going to be able to go through them all. Uh, but I, I do think it's important to continue to uh, put on the record the fact that these reports continue to be tabled and to continue to put on the record uh, the fact that there are so many people still being investigated by the Immigration Ombudsman. Uh, I don't know how many of these reports have now been tabled. I should try and um, find that out, but uh, I think there would have been uh, at least 10, if not more, since this part of the uh, Migration Act was put in place. Uh, this latest one, as I say, has about 126 or so uh, individuals, all of whom have been in immigration detention uh, for a year or more. Um, and it is, uh, it, it must, the point must continue to be made. The, the reason why the parliament put in place this section of the Migration Act was to ensure that people didn't disappear into the system, uh, that, uh, that any time anybody was in immigration detention for more than a year, uh, that their case would automatically be examined by the ombudsman, who's independent, of course, of the Department of Immigration. Uh, but even though the ombudsman uh, can make an investigation, all they can do at the end is provide an assessment and recommendation, and that is what has happened in each of these cases. Um, the uh, decision then as to what happens uh, in regard to that case uh, is up to the minister or the department as to, uh, to whether they accept that recommendation uh, or not. Uh, as uh, I was just commenting in regard to the minister's response to these, uh, the um, New Minister has noted with concern how long it's taken to resolve many of these cases, because in a number of times uh, the Ombudsman has made a recommendation that a person that consideration be given to giving a person a particular visa, uh, and the Minister's response has basically been to consider that, but not necessarily to act on it. Uh, and when we're talking about people who are, have their freedom taken away, who are in effect in jail, then it's a serious thing and there is a, an, an issue of urgency here. You don't just leave someone languishing in jail, let alone somebody who's never been uh, charged with any crime uh, to languish in jail while you just think about what you do with them. Uh, it should be uh, an absolute last resort that you take away somebody's freedom and certainly an absolute last resort that you keep them uh, in that detention environment. Uh, the important part of all of these, or most of these, uh, reports made by the Ombudsman into all of these different cases uh, is that um, it doesn't just make a recommendation about what should happen in regards to a visa, but it, in most cases details their experiences in detention and in many cases details uh, the adverse consequences, uh, the adverse health impacts of their detention. Uh, uh, it doesn't mention, but I will, that it is also a significant uh, expense uh, involved as well. Uh, so it does need to be emphasised. If you look at a lot of these ones here, uh, as I mentioned, uh, a number have ended up uh, with protection visas. 
uh, but they were in detention for uh, years and years um, prior to that. Uh, so this document is a, uh, uh, a compelling testimony to the pointlessness, the futility and uh, I believe the brutality, although the report certainly doesn't use that word, of locking people up in detention and some of these ones here and just flicking through four or five years, people who were then found to be refugees and people escaping uh, fleeing uh, regimes uh, like Iran uh, in, in a number of cases in here. Uh, widely known as a uh, uh, serious abuser of human rights uh, in regards to many of its citizens. And yet they come here uh, seeking protection and they get jailed for, for four years or more uh, at immense harm. Uh, so I do think it's important to continue to draw attention to the facts that these reports appeared and the details of what is in them. There's no point having a section in the Act requiring these things uh, to make sure people don't disappear, requiring these reports to be provided uh, if the reports themselves then disappear. I urge people to uh, examine these reports. They're available, I believe, on the Ombudsman's website uh, and continue to press for a more reform to the Migration Act to ensure that this sort of prolonged jailing of people who are not charged with any offence is brought to an end. Thank you, Senator Bartlett. Uh, are you seeking leave to continue? Uh, the question is that the Senate take note of the document. All those in favour say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. We now turn to um, um, orders of the day relating to government documents, um, which commence on page 11 of the notice paper. What I propose to do is call on senators who wish to take note of a document uh, listed page by page. Senator Watson. Oh, sorry, I thought you were rising to take note. He's not, is he? Senator, Senator, Thank sorry, you. Yeah. Uh, I move to take note of documents number 5, 9, 10, 11, 13, 14 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Um, is leave granted? No objection. Leave is granted. Um, Okay. No further documents on page 11. We now go to page 12. Any senator wishing to take Senator Nash? Thank you. I wish to take note of documents numbers 21, 22, 27, 29 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? No objection. Leave is granted. Senator Bartlett. Thank you. I move to take note of document 23 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, any objection? Uh, no. Uh, leave is granted. Um, Further documents on page 12? If not, page 13. Senate. Note of document number 30, the Future Fund. Seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Watson. Uh, well, is leave granted? No objection, leave is granted. Senator Nash. Thank you. I move to take note of documents number 36 and 42 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? No objection, leave is granted. Senator Bartlett. Thank you. I move to take note of document number 40 and seek leave to continue my remarks. So that was four, 40, 40? Four, 40. Four zero. Four zero. Uh, is leave granted? No objection. Leave is granted. Um, further documents, page 13. If not, we page 14. Any Senator Nash? I move to take note of documents number 49, 52, 58, 60 and 65 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? No objection. Leave is granted. Senator Bartlett. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I move to take note of documents 50 and 59 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Any objection to leave being granted? There is none. Leave is granted. Thank you. Further documents on page 14. Page 15. Senator Nash. I move to take note of documents 66, 67, 68, 69, 70 and 78 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Any objection to leave being granted? No. Leave is granted. Senator Bartlett. Uh, leave, uh, move to take note of document 81 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is there any objection to that? Uh, no. Leave is granted. Senator Watson. To take note of document number 81, the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust report. Now seek leave to continue my remarks. Yeah. Any objection? No objection. Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Watson. We come to page 16. Senator Nash. I move to take note of documents 82, 88, 90, 96 and seek leave to continue my remarks. 
Any objection? No objection. Leave is granted. Further documents on page 16? If not, page 17. Senator Nash. Thank you. I uh, move to take note of documents 105, 106, 107 and 113 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Any objection to leave being granted? If not, no, uh, leave is granted. Any um, further documents on page, which page were we on? <laughs> 17. We now move to page 18. Any documents on page 18? Senator Nash. I move to take note of documents 115, 119, 124 and 128 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Any objection to leave being granted? If not, um, leave is granted. Senator Bartlett. Thank you. I move to take note of document number 120 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is there any objection to leave being granted? If not, no. Um, leave is granted. Further documents on page 18. Page 19. Any Senator Nash. I uh, move to take note of document number 144 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Any objection? No objection. Leave is granted. Senator Bartlett. Thank you. I move to take note of documents 131, 132, 139 and 140 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Any objection to leave being granted? No. Leave is granted. Further documents on page 19. If not, we move to page 20. Senator Nash. I move to take note of document number 153 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Any objection? No objection. Leave is granted. Senator Bartlett. I move to take note of document 147 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Any objection? No objection. Leave is granted. Further documents, page 20. If not, we now proceed to uh, page 21. Senator Watson. I seek leave to... Uh, so you, to you, first of all, you're going to move to take note. Seek leave for documents number 160, 161, 162, and uh, seek leave to continue. Yep, yep. Um, any objection? No objection. Leave is granted. Senator Nash. Oh, sorry, Senator Bartlett. Uh, thank you. I move to take note of documents 163, 165 and 169. And seek leave to continue yep. my remarks. Any objection? Uh, no objection. Leave is granted. Further documents on page 21. Page 22, Senator Nash. I move to take note of document number 187 and <coughs> seek leave to continue my remarks. Any objection? No objection. Leave is granted. Senator Bartlett. I move to take note of documents 182 and 186 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Any objection? No objection. Leave is granted. Page 23. Senator Nash. Move to take note of documents number 193 and 194 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Any objection? No objection. Leave is granted. Senator Bartlett. Uh, move to take note of document 192 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Any objection to that? No objection. Leave is granted. Further documents on page 23? If not, um, page 24. Senator Nash. I uh, move to take note of documents number 206 and 208 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Any objection to leave being granted? There is none. Leave is granted. Thank you. Any further documents uh, on page 24? If not, um, we now proceed to Clark. That's, uh, yes, that concludes consideration of uh, government documents. and. Um, propose a question that the Senate do now adjourn. Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. <clears throat> in June 2007, I rose in this place to record the extent to which many South Australian workers, and in particular former employees of James Hardy, had become victims of the, of the debilitating and often fatal diseases associated with that company and the in asbestos industry generally. Those victims often included the workers' families and, over time, others unwittingly exposed to the now recognised dangers of the products. At that time, I made particular mention of some people whose long dedication to exposing the dangers of asbestos as a raw material and in the many products forms it took, who were responsible for the education of workers and the public, leading to the legislative prohibition of the product. 
Two of those noted at the time were Bernie Banton and Jack Watkins. Bernie Banton died at age 61 in late November 2007 of mesothelioma, contracted from working in the asbestos industry. Front and centre in the bitter fight for justice for victims of asbestos diseases, Mr Banton's passing was marked by tributes from workers and their unions and the parliamentary leaders of all sides of politics. He and his six-year campaign will be long remembered through the compensation fund established as a consequence of his energies. Bernie survived Jack Watkins by less than a month. Jack passed away in his sleep on Tuesday, the 16th of October 2007, as a result of chronic emphysema. He was aged 72. Born in pre-war Birmingham, Jack's early childhood was marked by the bombings and desolation of that city and the subsequent post-war sh shortages and poverty of his working-class family. Leaving school at age 13, Jack worked at those labouring jobs reserved for those who, through no fault of their own, were poorly educated, and, quick, and he quickly came to understand the dirty and often dangerous nature of those jobs. He also joined a union, a continuous uh, characteristic and passion throughout the whole of his life. Jack married young, and his wife, Cathy, became his greatest supporter and a source of inspiration and fierce pride for him. With two children, he and Cathy worked hard to provide an upbringing and home life better than their own, and despite a measure of success from their labours, in 1966 Jack and Cathy decided to migrate to Australia. Following their arrival, finding and holding jobs were sometimes difficult for Jack, as despite the need to provide for his family, he could not just roll over when confronted with job issues where he was compelled to speak up. This included advocating for his own and other families over issues arising from their initial hostel accommodation in Adelaide. His preparedness and ability to tackle such issues led to a period as an organiser with the Plumbers and Gasfitters Union, and a following stint in the building and construction industry led inevitably to a similar role with the Builders' Labourers' Federation, which along with other building unions was increasingly involved in exposing the incidence of asbestos in the building and construction industry. For Jack, the painful death of a union member from asbestos exposure and the subsequent devastating effect on the workers' family drove him to a focused and lifelong fight for the control and eradication of those materials and justice for the victims of their effects. As an organiser with the Builders' Labourers' Federation, Jack was equally at home in arguing his case from the stump at meetings of members where he made health and safety union business as he was with employers and parliamentarians. His input into formal asbestos awareness campaigns was extensive. Jack's approach to campaign activity was at times very unorthodox, but more often than not very effective. In circumstances where he believed formal approaches were either too slow or meeting such resistance as to place workers and indeed the public at risk, Jack was never one to shirk from direct action. There were many occasions during the early 1970s when workers and the public would arrive at buildings in the central business distri district of Adelaide to be confronted with a bright yellow sticker emblazoned with a black death's head and the legend danger affixed to, th to the front doors. Jack correctly assumed that the ensuring, ensuring inquiry would provoke uh, awareness of and <coughs> action around asbestos products in those buildings. A continuing part of Jack's energies was focused on schools, where it was found that young people were suffering likely exposure to the material. Perhaps in part as a consequence of himself being denied a proper education, Jack had a passion for the continuing education of the young. Through the actions of Jack Watkins and, other South, and others, South Australia as a state now enjoys a reputation as a national leader in asbestos safety management and legislative control. Such has not always been the case. During a period of time when the South Australian Parliament was debating early legislation for the control of asbestosis, asbestos, Jack was confronted with an instance of, presumably, industry-led lunacy that suggested asbestos was so safe that you could eat it. Appalled that such dangerous and indeed life-threatening nonsense was being repeated in the Parliament, Jack again took direct action. During the debate from the Strangers Gallery, he sprinkled a white substance to the chamber floor below. 
The, re the reaction from those uh, parliamentarians below was not as if they were receiving manna from heaven. Rather, it was described as pandemonium, in the midst of which Jack was arrested, handcuffed and brought before the Speaker. Charged with contempt of parliament, Jack was banned from its precincts for three years and he was forbidden to even mount the steps of Parliament House. For that period, his presence at Parliament House demonstrations was always publicly acknowledged as being from the terrace below. Jack later pointed out that his action was not driven by contempt but by frustration that the rate and pace of legislative change was not such that it prevented injury, illness and death of workers. He understood very well the powerful tools provided by legislation and was a tireless worker for and later major architect of South Australia's asbestos laws. The resultant publicity, however, was a platform from which Jack would capably argue the case to ban the production and use of asbestos and to control and restrict, where necessary, the use of other dangerous and injurious materials. In 1979, the South Australian government established the Asbestos Advisory Board, in the affairs of which Jack participated as a member from inception until his death. During the late 80s, the then South Australian Trades and Labor Council appointed Jack as the Council's Asbestos and Toxic Waste Liaison Officer to, to coordinate trade union and associated campaigns and to establish and maintain one of the very first asbestos registers in Australia. And it is a mark of Jack's commitment that after the grant funds were exhausted, he continued the project without any salary. Jack fought both state and federal governments for the remediation of the Islington Railway Workshop site in Adelaide and its conversion to a public park. The site was finally cleared of asbestos and toxic wastes, landscaped and named the Jack Watkins Memorial Park. Jack insisted that it stand as a tribute to workers who have died from an asbestos-related disease. In 2001, Jack was awarded the Centenary Medal for Services to Workplace, workplace Health, particularly in the area of asbestos investigation and education. <coughs> from its formation in 2005, he became president of the Asbestos Diseases Society of South Australia and was a member of the Asbestos Victims Association and Asbestos Coalition. Often described as an industrial hard man and most uh, certainly a formidable opponent, Jack was also a man who was awed by the natural world and had an intense love of the written word, poetry and verse. A proud man dedicated to his family, the death, death, death of his wife, Cathy, was uh, a profound loss to him. Jack was posthumously awarded the inaugural Lifetime Achievement Award for Occupational Health and Safety by SafeWorks South Australia. The citation notes his decade-long contribution at the grassroots level in advocating for and supporting those affected by asbestos. Jack's participation in the development of South Australia's asbestos laws and regulations will long stand as testimony to his dedication and activism and is his legacy to workers and their families. His commitment and achievement remains an inspiration to those continuing in the struggle to prevent asbestos disease and to secure justice for those already afflicted. Jack's passing should also stand as a reminder to those of us who can affect positive change that, to work, that the work to avoid or ease the suffering of those with industrial diseases is far from over. A thumbnail of Jack's life and activism appears in the book Movers and Shakers that was launched just two days after his death. That book records stories of activists who have made a difference in South Australia, and Jack Watkins was certainly a mover and a shaker. Before calling uh, Senator Watson, I would like to draw Senator's attention to the fact that this will be the last sitting week for one of our longest serving attendants, Lorna Lane. There are not many of us here today who will have worked in this chamber longer than Lorna. Lorna started as a parliamentary security attendant in 1989 and transferred to be a Senate attendant in 1996. She rose to be the chamber supervisor in 2003 and has remained in that role since that time. It is a mark of the efficiency of the attendants that their contribution to this place often goes unnoticed, but it is because of their work that this chamber can function smoothly. The attendants deliver an excellent service to all senators, occasionally in somewhat difficult circumstances. 
As the Chamber Supervisor, Lorna has shown great attention to detail and precision in the setup and operation of this chamber. Senators can have no better example than the hard work that has gone into preparing this chamber for the various events of this week. Lorna and all the attendants deserve our thanks and appreciation for that. On behalf of all senators, Lorna, thank you for your dedication and your commitment to the task. We wish you well in the future and congratulate you on your long contribution to this chamber. Thank you. Yeah. Senator Watson. Thank you, Mr President and honourable senators. Tonight I rise to pay a special tribute to the Australian Women's Land Army, whose members serve the nation with such grit, determination and service, and to which our nation really owes so much. The Australian Women's Land Army was created specifically to overcome the shortages of rural workers due to men joining the armed forces. During the Second World War, the demand for labour had become critical, particularly in rural areas necessary to feed, clothe and equip military personnel, while trying to maintain the maximum possible supplies of food for the general population, which had become critical. In my home state of Tasmania in August 1940, a meeting was held in Launceston to assess the viability of forming a women's land army in Tasmania, similar to the one already operating in Britain. By 1941, it was estimated that there were 235 women from all walks of life walk, working on farms throughout Tasmania. Recruits were required to be between 18 and 50 years of age and many of these women were able to continue with their university education or jobs in the city while giving up their holiday time to fulfil their commitment to such a worthy cause. By November 1941, the foresight of this group of women in 1940 was recognised when the Tasmanian State Government provided funding for the building of accommodation and facilities to open the Australian Women's Land Army Training School at the Cressy Research Station a model which was actually replicated later right across Australia. At Cressy in Tasmania, the, trust, the trainees were given up to eight weeks of intensive training in all aspects of general farm work. While working the day starting at 6.30 a.m., each trainee was given the chance to experience every type of work that they may be expected to do when they left the school to go out to their assignments. Lectures were also given three nights a week, and only a very small percentage of the trainees actually failed to qualify over the three years that the school operated. The fact that 90 per cent of the trustees, Mr President, were from non-rural backgrounds perhaps highlights the sense of adventure and patriotism that displayed by these very dedicated women. They left their jobs in offices, in department stores or factories to try something completely unknown in a world uh, full of total strangers. <coughs> Land Army members worked outdoors in all weather conditions, from the full sun in summer to the icy cold and wet conditions in winter. They worked in shearing sheds, they milked cows and followed the harvest season for fruit and vegetables. They learned to drive tractors harnessed teams of horses correctly, pitched sheaves of grain, uh, pressed straw and tended to stock. Perhaps the most telling indication of their contribution to the war effort was the huge increase in the production of, for example, flax, a product critical to the manufacture of yes, rope, certainly. uniforms and tents for the armed forces. Nationally, between 1939 and 1944, flax production increased from 2,000 acres to 40,000 acres. The friendships and the camaraderie formed during this time carried these women through remarkable feats of physical endurance, uh, loneliness and hardship. Their work and their dedication to duty won the respect initially of very, some very sceptical farmers. The, the concept strongly supported by the Tasmanian Dame Edith Lyons, Australia's first woman member of the House of Representatives, became national in July 42 and was administered under the Commonwealth Department of Labor and National Service with the recognition of improving the status of the Australian Women's Land Army through instituting it as a fourth woman's service. 
In January 1943, Cabinet endorsed the status of both divisions of the Australian Women's Land Army, full-time members and auxiliary members, as the official fourth service. The organisation was to be formally consti constituted under the national security regulations. A final draft of these regulations, however, was not completed until 1945 and was not acted on before the end of the war and the demobilisation of the Australian Women's Land Army. So despite the vital contribution to the broad Australian war effort throughout the three years from the formation to the end of the war, the Australian Women's Land Army was not given the status of military service and therefore not accorded the same benefits as members of other women's services. At the end of hostilities and the demobilisation on the 30th of November 1945, there were over 2,500 members of the Australian Women's Land Army, many of them foundation members of their state organisations who had provided five years of hard, physical and dedicated service to their country. Mr President, it is perhaps a sad reflection of history that until 1985, Members were denied the opportunity to march on Anzac Day in the biggest city parades or to join the RSL. And until 1991, some 46 years later, after the end of the war. So their lack of status also led to the destruction of service records. In 1997, many members became eligible for the Civilian Service Medal in recognition of their contribution to the Australian Women's Land Army and other wartime organisations had made to the war effort. But many of the longer serving members of the army regarded it as a very small token gesture of appreciation to all those women who had given so much of their youth and uh, believed that their efforts did indeed match that of the women from other services. Honourable Senators, as you will appreciate the type of activities undertaken, were especially detrimental to the physical health of many of these women when you consider the training was so brief and, even more importantly, did not cover good lifting practices. And bags of chaff and wheat and grain were indeed heavy in those days. So they lifted these heavy bags of grain and vegetables on a regular basis. So much of their work involved bending from the waist as in hard hand weaving, uh, weeding and turning flax for days on end. It is also interesting to note that no medical examinations were given on their discharge. Many of these uh, have suffered during their latter years from health conditions, back pain, arthritis, mobility, no doubt due to the heavy physical work undertaken while serving with the Army. Published in 1996, Mrs Jean Scott's book, Girls with Grit, Memories of the Australian Women's Land Army is an excellent publication and the back cover of which contains the following quotation, which I believe reflects the outstanding contribution of those women and of the army. And I quote, on the farms and in the dairies, on the outback station runs, those girls with grit are needed, just as men with guns. Post-war Prime Minister Ben Chifley stated, on this parliament rests the responsibility of seeing that the right thing is done. There is little doubt that the right thing was done for the enlisted ex-service men and women, but sadly not for the members of the Australian Women's Land Army. As members of a very grateful nation, I personally say thank you for a job well done and strongly advocate that members of the Australian Women's Land Army to be granted the recognition and the entitlements they deserve through a formal legislative approval as the fourth arm of the women's services. I think that tribute, that, that action would indeed be a small tribute to such wonderful women. I thank the Senate. S Senator Carol Brown. I rise to speak tonight on the vital but often delicate issue of organ donation in Australia. The issue is set to attract renewed attention and debate in the coming months, beginning with the Australian Organ Donation Awareness Week running from next Monday the 17th to Monday the 24th of February. This includes a na national media campaign to raise community awareness about the urgent need for organ and tissue donation in Australia. Following the National Organ Donor 
Donation Awareness Week, the Tasmanian Legislative Council Select Committee on Organ Donation is due to table its report in March. I understand that the National Clinical Task Force on Organ and Tissue Donation, established by the former Minister for Health and Ageing in 2006, is set to hand down its report, including its views on the principles for reform for the National Organisational Infrastructure for Organ Donation. All this momentum on the issue of organ donation nationally and in my home state of Tasmania in the coming months promises to stimulate renewed debate regarding the best way of improving organ donation rates and ultimately access to organ transplants in Australia. As most of you are probably already aware, Australia has one of the highest success rates for organ transplants in the world, with, an average, with on average 90 per cent of patients still alive a year after their operation. The success rate for kidney transplant recipients is even higher, with an average of 96.5 kidney transplant recipients alive one year on. These figures undoubtedly prove that the choice to donate one's organs in Australia can and does in fact result in real outcomes in the saving of lives. They also provide a source of hope for all Australians and their families who are in need of an organ transplant. Indeed, it is estimated that one organ donor can potentially save up to as many as 10 Australians in need of transplants. The precious value of the decision to donate is proven by the fact that last year alone, while only 198 Australians were able to successfully donate their organs, roughly 626 were able to receive an organ transplant. Unfortunately, these overwhelmingly positive figures regarding the success rate of organ transplants in Australia are not matched by the overwhelmingly positive figures regarding the rate of organ donation in Australia. Sadly, while Australia has one of the highest success rates for organ transplants in the world, it also has one of the lowest rates of organ donation. In real terms, this means while a patient's chances of survival after an organ transplant are very high, their chances of actually securing an organ suitable for transplant are much lower. For the majority of Australians waiting for an organ transplant, their biggest battle is in fact in waiting for and finding a suitable donor. Currently there are approximately 1,800 Australians suffering from life-threatening illnesses awaiting an organ transplant. It is estimated that 100 of these people will die before they are actually able to receive an organ donation. With over 90 per cent of people in Australia indicating that they support the concept of organ donation, the tragic and possibly avoidable loss of these lives just does not make sense to me. In light of the success rates of organ transplants and the widespread public support for organ donation, something needs to be done to improve the rate of donation in Australia. This is simply the only difference between those 100 extra lives being saved or lost. However, while in theory the solution may seem relatively simple, in practice there are a number of various factors that need to be clearly considered. As I acknowledged earlier, while improving organ donation rates in Australia needs to be, I believe, a national priority, the issue itself is a sensitive and delicate one. The issue of organ donation is an intrinsically difficult one, as to save one life, another first must be lost. Therefore, under the current system, a person electing to donate their organs are by nature first forced to face their own mortality to a degree, which for some can be quite challenging and confronting. Likewise, the task of communicating such wishes to loved ones who often have difficulty conceiving the stark reality of such a decision. Further, for such families, if they are ever faced with the reality of such a decision, it could not come at a more emotionally challenging time. On the other hand, patients awaiting a transplant and their families are forced with the difficulty of balancing their desire to receive an organ with the reality that this must first result in the loss of another life. The re reality is that, for many, the decision to donate their organs ends up being an emotionally charged one, as it is inevitably associated with death. However, for anyone that has had the pleasure, as I have had, of meeting either a transplant recipient or a patient awaiting a transplant, their concept of the decision to donate is quite a different one. It's one of overwhelming life. For these people, the selfless decision by another to donate their organs quite simply converts for them into a second chance at life. 
These people have often been forced to endure the challenge of living with a life-threatening illness for a significant period of time, and the receipt of an organ suitable for donation often signifies the end of their pain and anguish up, up to that point and a chance to start afresh. During the course of the Community Affairs Committee inquiry into patient travel assistance scheme last year, I met a number of people on dialysis awaiting kidney transplants, and their courage was commendable. The majority, because of their age, were faced with the prospect of, of di dialysising three times a week for the remainder of their life and maybe never receiving a transplant. Despite this, I had one, I had one particular gentleman tell me that he himself planned, if he was able, to donate the rest of his organs, although he doubted his kidneys would have much use to anyone. For me, this comment uh, showed what it mean means to be a donor, and it's all about giving. In a recent paper, Andrew Lawrence rightly points out that organ transplants extend life, enhance the quality of life and reduce health costs. Speak to any successful transplant recipient and they will confirm the validity of the first two points. And compare, as Lawrence does, the cost of maintaining a patient on dialysis with the immediate cost of an organ transplant, and the third point is also true. Lawrence estimates that hemodialysis for one patient costs around $50,000 a year, whereas the cost of a kidney transplant is under $15,000 and only an extra $15,000 to $20,000 is required for ongoing treatment for transplant patients. Further, this means in real terms that if 1,500 pa patients awaiting a kidney transplant receive successful transplant, transplants, at least 22.7 million on the above estimates would be freed up in the health system in the first year to be spent elsewhere. Therefore, why not only being the best available treatment for patients suffering from this in this case kidney failure, organ transplantation is also, also results in a reduction in the costs associated with patient care. Yet, as I noted earlier, despite all this, despite 90 per cent of Australians supporting organ donation, despite there being more patients waiting for organs than there is donors, despite transplantation being cheaper and the best available option for the treatment of a patient suffering from organ failure, Australia still has one of the lowest organ donation rates in the world. And as I pointed out earlier, there are, there are currently two separate reports due to be handed down in the next couple of months at both the state and federal level, which will examine ways in which the rate of organ donation in this country could be improved. I personally uh, would support any initiative which results in a real increase in the number of organ donors in Australia and believe that all appropriate options should and need to be considered. However, not wanting to, to preempt any findings or outcomes likely to come out of the two separate reports, experience here and overseas highlights several factors which play a pivotal, pivotal role in lifting rates of donations, including one, the quality of the health system and services available, and two, the actual programs used at the coalface in hospitals to identify potential donors. Obviously, the continued success rates of organ transportation in Australia will depend on the health system's capacity to cope with an increased number of transplant patients and surgeries in the event of an increase in the rate of donations over the next couple of years. The Rudd Labor government has established a $2 billion national health reform plan to be implemented over the next four years to improve Australia's health system and ensure better health services for patients in hospitals, including reducing waiting times for those who require essential hospital services such as those requiring organ transplants. This reform plan will ensure that hospitals around Australia will, over the next four years, be better equipped to handle any increase in the number of organ transplant surgeries likely to occur as a result of an increase in number of donations. Likewise, the National Health Reform Plan will facilitate a range of options, including re the resources available to hospitals when it comes to the implementation of programs aimed at increasing and identifying potential organ donors. Because only 1 per cent of patients who pass away are suitable candidates for organ donation, effectively, effectively coordinated programs in hospitals used to identify potential donors are crucial. A 1991 study found that 50 per cent of families of potential donors were never asked about Order. donation. Senator because Brown, your, your time has expired. How much longer did you have? You I seek leave to incorporate. Please. Leave is granted. Leave is granted. Senator Nash. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I rise tonight to talk about drought, and I know that might seem a little incongruous, given that all we seem to be hearing on the radio and the television at the moment is the uh, plenitude of rainfall around the country. But unfortunately, there are many places in this country that still have not received reasonable rain. The reason I'm standing tonight is because I, as a representative of rural and regional Australia— And a very good one. <laughs> thank you for your interjection, Senator Evetts. Uh, do not want it to slip under the radar how many farming communities are still suffering very much from the effects of drought. Now, it's quite easy to listen to the radio reports and, and believe that the whole country is being inundated by uh, water from the heavens, but it's not entirely true. It's great to see where it has happened. It's wonderful for those people and producers in those regions where it has rained. But we have got to remember, particularly in this place, that there are many people who still have not received rain. And it's vitally important to remember and to recognise that even where we have received rain, that the effects of the drought are still continuing. Now, we've had droughts in some areas across this country for up to seven years. And it takes more than a few inches of rain here or a shower of rain there to alleviate the effects of the drought. This is an incredibly serious issue because it's not only our farming families and our farming communities, it's the flow-on effects right out through those rural and regional communities, those knock-on effects when there is no income coming into those farm, into that agricultural sector that then flows on. It flows on to the local agribusiness, it flows on to the local fuel station, the local news agents, the local supermarket, the local clothes shops, the local chemists, the local butchers. And they are all people in that community with families who deserve to know that the government here in this place is doing the best that they possibly can for them. Now, it does seem over the last couple of months we have had a change in government and we are now starting to see the government approach to those rural and regional communities. And I must say that I have been absolutely appalled to see that approach. Because, Mr. President, what that approach has been is to put in place measures which cut spending to rural and regional Australia. Now, I know that Labor. I know that Labor, with their newfound fiscal responsibility and this wonderful attitude they've got now to this fiscal responsibility, thinks it's important that they cut spending. But they've started with the bush. They have started with rural and regional Australia. They have started with the very people that are least able to cope with those funding cuts. And I reiterate again, seven years of drought and one shower of rain does not change the effects of those seven years. Now, I noticed that I did notice actually it was the finance minister, not the agricultural minister, who put forward these cuts, which I find quite surprising, really, because as hard as I've searched, I can't actually see where the agricultural minister has a had anything to do with this. So maybe he's been completely sidelined. Just a doormat. And b made no comment whatsoever. Made no comment whatsoever on nearly. $500 million worth of cuts to regional Australia, and here's the Agriculture Minister. Now, there's been a lot made about him coming from, coming from Sydney, coming from Beverly Hills. I don't particularly care. I just want an Agriculture Minister to do a good job. Who cares? Who cares? Thank you, Senator Abetz. I'll take that interjection. Who cares? And Minister Burke keeps running around the countryside saying, oh, I'm a city boy and I know they'll all know better than me, and hiding under the fact that he is a city boy but he's still going to do a good job. Well, maybe he will, but we certainly have not seen any sign of it yet. <laughs> Travelling around the countryside from one state to another does not make you a minister doing a good job. The proof is in the pudding. And so far, all we've seen from the agriculture minister is a bunch of cuts to rural and regional people. That's right. 
And the most interesting thing is these are some of the poorest communities in the country. These are some of the lowest socioeconomic communities in this country. And what's the Razor Gang done? Targeted rural and regional communities. Now, I think it's appalling. It's not fair and it's not right. Because what we've seen is nearly $100 million cut in drought assistance. The end of seven years of drought, what government minister would think of cutting assistance to regional communities at the end of seven years of drought? Apparently, from what I have been able to glean from what Minister Burke has said, it's because we have had some showers of rain and isn't it all more opti optimistic? And the forecast is good. The forecast. The forecast is good. He has not gone into the lounge rooms of those people that have not had a decent income for years and years and years and years, but the forecast is good, so therefore we'll cut the program. If that doesn't show how out of touch Labor is with regional communities, I don't know what is. Mm. These are families that are trying to put food on the table, trying to make ends meet, working families, I might add working families that are trying to put food on the table to make ends meet and to get through this drought and to find some light at the end of the tunnel that hopefully they will make it through and be able to stay on that farm and be able to keep producing food and fibre for this nation. But what do Labor do? They cut funding to regional drought programs. Now, I don't know about anybody else in this chamber, but to me that is stupid. Mm -hmm. And around the, this country, I am sure people would be saying, why on earth is the government doing this? Why is the government doing this? There are a range of other things in this trillion dollar economy that they could perhaps have started with rather than rural and regional Australia. And they should be ashamed that they have taken nearly half a billion dollars away from rural and regional communities in this time, which is probably the, at the hopefully potentially coming to the end of the worst drought in Australia's history. What that shows is a lack of empathy and understanding, and I would suggest that the minister do a lot more travelling around, because what he's done so far probably has not helped at all by what we're looking at now. But then again, maybe it was out of his hands. Maybe it was the finance minister. Maybe the agriculture minister had absolutely nothing to do with it. Like Senator Wong like Senator Wong, Senator Abetz, had absolutely nothing to do with it because they've got no input and they're not taken seriously. And we only have to look at a couple of other programs that have been, that have been cut, $10 million, to drought, $10 million cut from drought research. From drought research. Senator Wong is continually, continually going on about climate change and the importance of climate change, and it is important. So why on earth would you cut funding to drought research? We know that this is one of the driest continents in the world. We know that we are going to be facing drier times. And what does the Labor government do? Cuts funding to drought research. And then we are continually, continually hearing about Labor saying how important skills are. Skills are so important. We're the only ones that can fix it. The government's the only one that can fix it. Well, they've slashed nearly $50 million from the apprenticeships incentives for agriculture and horticulture programs. That's right. I'm sorry, I might be missing something here. Skills that Labor are continually talking about, slashing of an apprenticeship program. It's become a clear Orwellian case. If they keep saying things, they will actually become. And they think the people out there in the Australian community will believe them. Well, our job here is to make sure that they realise the truth of what's going on here. Yeah, yeah. And things like ending the extension that was proposed to the living away from home allowance yeah. for Australian school-based apprentices. These are working families that these measures were put in place to help, and Labor is cutting the funding to them. Working families in regional Australia, working families in rural Australia, who were hoping against hope that their worst fears wouldn't be realised and Labor might not be like Labor of old and actually be prepared to do an empathetic job, but no, we are not so lucky. 
and people need to realise what Labor is going to do, what they are starting to do to rural and regional Australia, and be aware it's not fair, it's not right, and it's not on. The Senate stands adjourned till 9.30am tomorrow.